Alan Clue. I'll be the host for today's forum. Um, this is, as I've said, the, the WCRP Climate Research Forum, looking at climate research priorities for the next decade for the Europe and Western Asia region. Um, just some technical um, guidance before we get started formally, while people are still joining. As we've noted, can you please have Slido loaded? Um, the link is in the um, is in the chat box. Uh, it was also sent with the uh, invitation. A reminder to keep your microphone and video off unless you're presenting or are one of our panelists or have been asked to speak. And if you're having any technical problems during the course of this forum, then look for Frank and Miriam's name in the participant list and send them a, a message in chat and they'll try and help you as best they can. There are two ways that we're going to engage with you today. Um, you can post questions to us um, through Slido and we'll give you a little practice session with Slido in a moment. And those Slido will be being monitored and the questions will be conveyed to the relevant chair or moderator. Um, we encourage discussion and dialogue um, in WebEx chat, so please do use that. But if you have questions for us, please put them into Slido. A reminder that we are recording this forum, we're already recording now, um, and we're doing that to assist in documenting the discussion and the outcomes from the forum. The actual uh, video itself also will be posted on the WCRP website, so it's important that you know that. Um, this is to enable people who couldn't join us today to, to watch the forum, so that's just a reminder that we are recording. This is a slightly more detailed version of the program, just to let you know how the next three and a half hours will unfold. We'll go to a formal introduction and welcome in a moment, uh, including an introduction to Slido, then a, a WCR pre presentation from myself, and then session three is where we're going to showcase some of the WCRP climate science, both achievements to date and also our plans for some new science. And then hopefully we'll have time for a very short break, um, but don't go away too far because session four is going to be a really interesting session. Uh, we've got two uh, sequential panel discussions, and I think that's going to be a really interesting discussion. So we hope that you can stay with us right through session four, and then we'll then we'll wrap up. So I will now hand over to Detlef Stammer, who is the chair of the WCRP Joint Scientific Committee, to formally uh, welcome and open the forum. Detlef. Thank you very much, Helen. And uh, indeed, on behalf of the World Climate Research Program, I welcome you also, everybody here online today. Um, the numbers are going up. We now have actually 84 people um, online, and um, every second kind of another person is joining. So everybody joining now, um, also very much welcome you um, for this uh, research forum. And um, the, I think it's, it's probably useful to start a little bit about uh, what the purpose of, of these research fora are. And um, as you might know, um, WCRP since um, uh, 2018 roughly is in the process of um, reorienting uh, itself um, to address um, the really the urgent problems ahead of us for climate research. Um, and it went through a, a very elaborate um, a process of uh, writing a new strategic plan. And we are now in the process of actually implementing this new strategic plan, the new science, um, developing um, new ways to do research in, within WCRP. And as part of this, we actually made quite some change to WCRP, as you might have known it from the past. And, and the idea of these research fora is really that we go out into the regions um, and discuss these plans with you, uh, with the community, um, to hear your ideas, to um, inform you also about uh, what is being planned and where the new activities will be, where you can join in, where you can participate, but where my, you might also have new ideas um, that we haven't thought about ourselves in the past that we really should pick up. And of course, you can ask the question why our regions are so important. Um, first of all, it's actually convenience for you. Um, we, we are a world climate research program, world meaning we are really coordinating climate research around the world. But of course, um, being in different time zones, it's not that always that easy, in fact, to find a common time zone for everybody. So we actually designed these re regional uh, fora 
around the world. And this is um, not the first one. It's uh, also not the last one where we go into different regions, um, talk to people, um, hear opinions, um, and connect, for instance, also to the next generation, to maybe the next leadership, um, but very important also to, to the um, uh, funders, to the agencies, the, the governments um, that can benefit from our science to inform, to also hear opinions, maybe concerns or new ideas. And, and so this is really um, the, the ideas behind this re uh, regional research fora. Um, as I said, this is not the first one. Um, all the, the others were actually very exciting. We really um, got new ideas, um, input that we haven't thought about before. And um, this one now is Europe and Western Asia to, in fact, um, uh, address all the communities um, here in, in, this, uh, in this region. Um, and uh, it, I'm really looking forward for another discussion round. Um, uh, also, the questions or suggestions that we receive through Slido, um, I'm really looking forward to see these now, and um, because we will take them forward uh, in the in the during the meeting and afterwards. And with that, um, I turn back to Helen uh, Clue, um, who will um, now start the, the second session, I suppose. Um, on our climate futures, really explaining where WCRP stands and its uh, new implementation. Helen, back to you. Thank you very much, Detlef. Uh, just to let you know, your video doesn't seem to be working. I'm not sure if you've got a bandwidth, but um, I'll let you look at that and I'll just keep moving. Um, before we get to the, the next session, actually, we're going to do a um, a couple more things that are important in this opening session. The first is to thank the people um, that have organised this forum. Something like this doesn't happen by itself. Um, a local organising committee comprising um, people from our WCRP community who we've called our regional focal point. So from this region, help design the content um, and format for this forum. And I'm really grateful to all of them, as well as Detlef and other members of our joint scientific committee who really put a lot of work into thinking what today would look like. Uh, we've had outstanding support from some of our project officers uh, for Click and Spark, Beatrice and Marika, and our WCRP secretariat, Narelle, uh, who are supporting us today, but have supported the organisation of today um, for many months leading up to today. I'd like to thank DWD and Frank and Miriam for hosting the WebEx video conference platform and being there today to answer our technical problems and in the weeks leading up to today as well. So as I've just before we get into the session two, as we said, we're going to use Slido and we're using Slido in two different modes. And if you've got Slido open, you'll see there's a Q&A function and you'll see there's a poll function. We're going to use both. The Q&A is where you can post questions um, to us. And if you're looking at the questions, you can upvote them. So we can therefore look at the questions that are most popular. We'll aim to answer as many questions as we can, but we'll also keep a record of all those that we haven't. And we're aiming to get a frequently answered ask question document out from the forum to capture any key questions that we haven't been able to ask, or sorry, answer, not ask. <laughs> Slido poll is where we ask you some questions, and so that's where we ask you to enter your aunt, um, to enter some ideas, give us your feedback, your responses, and so on. So, as an icebreaker, and to practice using Slido, head on over to Slido in your browser, and we'll go into the icebreaker question, which is, where are you joining us from? And if the technology works, here we go. Um, so we've got quite a few people from Hamburg. It's always interesting to see when this comes up. Um, as Detlef said, we we run these um, forums thinking about time zone friendly regions, but it's always interesting that we get people from far, much further afield. So we've got Philippines and um, and I think I saw someone from China as well. Anyway, but obviously um, a lot from Europe. So keep entering where you're from. It's interesting for us to know where we've where our participants have joined. We're up to 112, so that's great. The next question, which is also really important for us, you can keep um, entering where you're from in that, even though we're going on to the next one, which is, have you heard of the World Climate Research Program? Um, and it's always interesting to see, you know, that we actually have some people who have um, decided to join and learn about WCRP, even though they might not know, might not have heard of us before. And that's good because we do spend some time describing who we are and what we do. 
because of this is a, a we've got a lot um, in this uh, forum today, we need to keep moving reasonably quickly. So if you can keep entering your information into that survey, hopefully you've got a, uh, a feel for how Slido works. Um, this survey that we're doing just at the moment will close in the next few seconds or so. So last chance to enter your information. Let's go back up and see where we're at with our where everybody's from. Good distribution across Europe, that's great to see. And I'm just looking to see if we've got people from Western Asia joining us as well. Yes, a few, that's good. Okay, all right, we'll move to the next session now. So that's the end of the um, opening session. And Detlef has already um, touched on what we've been doing in the World Climate Research Programme for the last year or so. I guess I'd like to preface this presentation with the observation that I'm sure we're all aware of about the demand for actionable climate information, which is greater than, than ever um, across all sectors of our society and economy, from emergency services through to the health sector, energy and infrastructure, and even our financial institutions are now considering both the risks and opportunities of climate change and what that means for their business. The World Climate Research Programme, or WCRP, does, it takes the lead in ensuring that our climate science is providing the enduring and rigorous foundation that's needed to meet that demand for robust and useful climate information. And as Detlef said, through our new strategic plan, we're evolving to ensure that that scientific understanding and knowledge that societies need to meet the challenges that we're seeing now and into the and in the decades ahead um, in areas such as disaster risk reduction, climate adaptation, climate mitigation. This means developing some new science initiatives as well as refreshing and strengthening our core research. And the aim of today is to describe some of these ongoing core research and some of these new initiatives. It's a fairly high level and short uh, presentation. So it is intended to be a first step in what we hope will be a much broader dialogue. Because we want to explore how we can work with you, our partners, our co-sponsors, our research communities, so that we can achieve our vision of a world that uses sound, relevant and timely climate science for a sustainable present and future. WCIP was established um, 40 years ago to address frontier scientific questions. These are questions related to the coupled climate system that are too large and too complex to be tackled by any individual nation or agency or even scientific discipline. It takes a world research program to do that research into the global climate system, including the interactions and feedbacks within the system, with human systems as well, and with natural ecosystems. It involves observations, analyses, and modeling across all time and space scales. This requires coordination and deep collaboration around the world and across disciplines. So when we were established in 1980, the goal that the purpose of WCRP was to facilitate that coordination so that we would advance the understanding of the Earth's climate system, especially its predictability and especially to understand how the climate was being affected by human activities. Looking forward to the future, we recognise the critical need for climate information, as I've already indicated, for decision making, for managing climate risks, supporting climate mitigation uh, and climate adaptation policies and strategies. And meeting that need will require new science, new technologies and new ways of co-designing knowledge. As I said, it will take a worldwide coordinated effort involving stakeholder engagement and a well-prepared scientific workforce. And we need to build strong global partnerships because we can't do this on our own. So our new strategic plan addresses these challenges and opportunities for the coming decade as captured by our vision. And it clarifies our mission, which is our purpose, if you like, which is around coordination and facilitation. A strategic plan was launched in 2019. Um, there is a copy of it on the web. You can see the link there if you want to go and download a copy. And we have a video in the next session that actually talks about the history of the WCRP and some aspects of the strategic plan. So for now, I'm just going to show this one schematic, which is sort of a, our strategic plan on a page. It, 
uh, to orient you to the schematic, our scientific objectives are there on the right hand side. The video that we're going to show actually talks about these. What I wanted to note is that the first three of those are what you would expect a long running climate research program to be exploring. But the fourth objective is a new one in our strategic plan and it recognises this urgent need to bridge climate science and society by better integrating natural and social sciences. This occur, of course, these objectives occur across a range of interacting space and timescales. And understanding, observing, modelling and collaboration are all at the very core of what we do. This depends critically on infrastructure, whether that's for our observations and modelling, but also for managing our data, curating it, sharing it, and to support our outreach and communications. To connect with the wider science community, we must build partnerships, as I've already said, and address capacity building and education needs. And throughout, engagement and communication is always a priority. So since launching our plan in 2019, we've been very much focused on implementation, especially to identify and prioritise that research that's needed in the decades ahead to achieve our outcomes. And one of the things that we've done as part of that is to develop a new initiative, a new series of what we've called lighthouse activities to support and even accelerate this priority research. These lighthouse activities are designed to advance some of the new science and the new technologies and even institutional frameworks that are needed to manage climate risk and to meet society's urgent need for robust and actionable climate information. These might be major experiments or high visibility projects or even infrastructure. Importantly, they're intended to be ambitious, exciting, very much externally and impact focused. To achieve their goals, they need to draw on all of WCRP's core scientific and technical capabilities, as well as our strategic partnerships. These five lighthouse activities that were on the previous slide and they're listed here now, they're all currently developing their draft science plans. And that means that the science scope and their strategic partnerships are still being developed. You'll hear about four of them, the four in yellow font there, in the next session. So I don't want to steal the thunder of our lighthouse uh, presenters. Each, this slide shows, a, if you like, a thumbnail sketch of each of them. So maybe I'll just read through them very quickly, noting that you'll get much more detail in the next session. So explaining and predicting Earth system change is about building that capability for observing, explaining and providing early warning and prediction of how our Earth system is changing both globally and regionally, particularly on the near term timescales. My climate risk is looking at climate risk from a decision um, perspective and developing a new framework so that that information that's being delivered is meaningful very much at the local scale for those who are using it. Safe landing climates is all about exploring the routes to climate safe landing spaces for human and natural systems on much longer timescales, multi-decadal, centennial, millennial timescales. This is where our climate, earth system and socioeconomic sciences must be um, connected. This is where we might start to explore pathways for achieving key sustainable development goals. The academy, which is a, a cross-cutting lighthouse activity, is about understanding what some of the education um, needs are for our climate science community and users of climate science. And it will draw on all of the WCR. And then Digital Earth, which is also cross-cutting and which won't be presented today, is about developing a digital and dynamic representation of the Earth system, combining models and observations to enable us to explore the past, the present and futures of the Earth system. Now, because Digital Earths don't get a 10 minute talking spot, I've given them one slide. This gives a little bit of a schematic about what they're thinking in terms of their science plan. The schematic shows sort of the four elements that they're exploring, but some key aspects are about building a framework to develop capabilities for the global community and the principles um, that underpin the uh, software development so that it's open and freely available and modular and interoperable and being built to agreed upon standards. We envisage that there would be both global and regional digital earths um, or, or 
digital twins uh, under this framework. And there are four components that span science. So observations and data assimilation and fine scale modeling all require new science, new technologies. Um, we know that we've got you know, dramatic changes happening in our computer architecture and machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we want to blend in these new technologies and we will engage with our user communities through regional demonstrations. So as I said, the science plans are being developed um, as we speak by the middle of this year, so later this month, with the goal of broader consultation throughout 2021. This consultation is important because we do want to strengthen the diversity of the community that we're engaging with, not just as contributors to that science, but also as users of the research, because we want to co-design some of these activities. And we need to ensure that these lighthouse activities are very strongly linked to our core research that we're doing as well. We're also interested in exploring interest from potential funding partners. And if you're interested in how to connect with our lighthouses, there'll be lots of information later on to tell you how you can do that. But as well as our lighthouse activities, um, WCRP continues to develop the science and the technologies that are needed to advance our understanding of the Earth's climate system. And the science that's needed, and the approaches that are needed to co-develop climate information to support decision makers, to support adaptation planning and climate mitigation policies. To do that requires a very large range of skills and capabilities, as you can imagine. I've listed just a few on this slide. WCRP has fostered and developed these capabilities, like what you see here, and the research communities that sit behind them over many decades. And we're committed to ensuring that, we, that these endure into the future and that they are nurtured and sustained into the future because they're the very foundation of the climate system science that is supported and coordinated by WCRP. Organisationally, they exist primarily through, in the past, four core projects, several working groups, uh, a series of panels and advisory councils. And I'm just in the next few slides going to share with you um, where this work is going into the future. So these are our four for projects which will remain and continue into the future. As I've indicated, they're very important to building our um, core underpinning um, research capability in WCRP along with the communities. They are reviewing their science priorities and goals and you'll hear a snapshot from three of these uh, in the next session. So CLIVAR is all about climate and ocean variability. GWEX is about global and regional energy and water budgets, the Earth's atmosphere and surface. CLIC is about understanding the role the, cryo the cryosphere plays in the global climate system and how we can use the cryosphere to detect climate change. And SPARC is all about the role of the atmosphere in driving climate variability and prediction and atmospheric dynamics and therefore predictability and also atmospheric chemistry and its links to climate. These are all linked. We have joint projects and joint panels and each of these core projects are doing a great deal of work that cannot possibly be represented in this simple slide. So I encourage you to go to their websites to learn more, but also you'll get a snapshot soon. In the new WCRP, we're also designing two new core projects. And these are under design, under development as we speak. The first recognises the ongoing importance, obviously, of Earth system modelling and observations, so ESMO. But importantly, it will include the fusion of models and data because that's the way to address some of the real scientific challenges that we've got. So this new core project will unite and strengthen the work of existing communities and groups. So many of you will know about the working group on coupled modeling, which supports CMIP. We'll have a CMIP presentation later. The working group on numerical experimentation and sub-seasonal to interdecadal prediction. And those working groups will continue under this new core project. The second new core project is RIFs or Regional Information for Societies. And that's about developing the science and capability needed to provide societally relevant climate information for regions. And again, it will unite and strengthen the existing work of Cordex, one of our high profile projects, and we'll have a presentation from Cordex as well, and the work from our working group on regional climate. 
But as well as uniting and strengthening this existing work, these new core projects will provide a focus and a vision for what's needed in the decades ahead. Some of you will be familiar with WCRP's grand challenges that were initiated some time ago. There are seven of them. Now, some of these grand challenges set out their goals and have achieved those science goals and they will come to an end and we will celebrate and acknowledge those achievements. Some of them have still have got new scientific challenges that need to be explored and so that work will transition into other parts of WCRP. That's what we mean by uh, sunsetting our grand challenges over the next year or so. So this slide is intended to illustrate how this all fits together. So as part of our new WCRP, we have refreshed and simplified our structure to better support our strategic plan and our science goals. And I'm showing it here to illustrate the various elements and how they fit. So down the bottom, we have at the very foundation, if you like, of WCRP, our core projects and their research communities. I've already gone through the four ongoing core projects and our two new ones. You'll hear more about the lighthouse activities uh, in a short while. And providing the scientific guidance and direction uh, for the whole WCRP is the Joint Scientific Committee, which Detlef and I are chair and vice chair of. It's referred to as the Joint Scientific Committee because WCRP actually has three co-sponsors. The World Meteorological Organization, I've just brought up their logos, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and the International Science Council. And so, the joint refers to the, the role of our three parents, if you like. We're supported, the whole of the WCRP, including the JSC, are supported by our secretariat. Each of the core projects are supported by an international office, uh, as long, along with um, Cordex, and we've just announced uh, a new international office to support CMIT. And the other thing that's important that I wanted to mention is that there are a number, many sort of activities that you'll be familiar with that will continue to happen in the WCRP. These might be fixed term projects or a conference to explore frontier science. These will continue, of course, and they will be done under the sponsorship of one or more of our core, uh, core elements, core projects and, and lighthouse activities, I should say. So we're in what we call a soft transition to, the, um, to this new WCRP. That really means that we're moving into the new structure before everything is fully designed and developed. We're living in the new WCRP from this year. So in terms of a timeline, 2020 involved a lot of consultation and review and assessment about what we're doing, what we're going to continue doing, what some of these new elements might be, such as the lighthouse activities, the new core projects. So that's in the design phase. The structure will be in, is, is pretty much in place from here on. And by um, the first half of 2023, we actually hope to launch the fully fledged new WCRP at our Open Science Conference in early 2023. There's the first circular. If you want to know more about that, go to our website. And as I've indicated, we'll be sunsetting um, and transitioning the grand challenges. So in the, do in the last few minutes, I actually want to shift the focus now from here is a WCRP, here's what we do, um, and here's what we've achieved. And I want to now talk about you, because it's really important for us, for the whole WCRP, and especially for the JSC and Detlef and I as the chair and vice chair, to really reiterate the importance of collaboration and partnerships. So we've called this our joint climate future because we want to, we are very keen to work with all of our co-sponsors and partners and our national agencies towards this common goal of ensuring that our climate knowledge and information is accessible and relevant. That's going to require the best minds across physical climate science, social science and beyond. And it means engaging with our early career researchers because they're going to be the next generation of leaders and they are the scientists of today and tomorrow. And we need to build strong partnerships. So today is the first step. We're keen to explore ways to, to continue to connect with you into the future, not just today, but beyond today. And you can help us to shape the future or the new WCRP. We really welcome your suggestions and your feedback on any of our science or our activities, or even our structure, if you like. And you'll have a chance to do that using Slido in a short while. We also wanted to take this opportunity to really 
thank the generous support that we've received over many years and decades from many nations and many agencies. Um, and we're very grateful for that support that we've received, that has supported the WCRP to really answer some of these most fundamental questions, such as you know, what is the effect of human activities on the climate system and what does that mean for the future and for climate risk into the future? And that's underpinned global agreements like the Paris Agreement. And we really welcome you to continue on this journey with us to foster and coordinate and co-design the science that's important for you. This is because, as we've already said, we're here to support your needs as well. Um, and so there's different ways that we can work with you and today and beyond we can talk about what that might look like. But it might be to jointly identify new research frontiers and challenges or new collaborations. Or there might be something that we can direct our scientific expertise that sits in our core activities like the core project or the lighthouse activity. So as I said, we're, we're keen to continue having a conversation with you. And in that regard, we see today as just the beginning. We want your ideas, as we've said. Um, for example, perhaps there could be follow-up forums to focus on a particular research theme, or maybe there's a discussion, a bilateral discussion we can have with you to talk about how we can strengthen our partnerships and talk about research that's of mutual benefit, or maybe research that we can co-design. And we are also quite keen, as I've said, to connect with our mid-career researchers. So if you want to talk with us, you have to know how, obviously. So we will be in touch with you after today, just to let you know. So if you don't want us um, to, to continue engaging, do let us know. And there's a, there's a variety of different ways that you can connect beyond today. You can email us with questions at that address there. You can register with us for email updates. You can register at the Climate Research Forum site um, so that we can learn more about what you're interested in and you can keep an eye on our website for updates. But for now, I want to thank you for your attention for this part of the session. And we're now going to move straight to session three, where you're going to learn, if you like, a lot more about what WCRP have, have, are doing and what we're intending to do in the future. And then there'll be an opportunity for some interaction with you at the end of session three. So at this point, I hand over to Detlef. Um, and just so you know, what we're going to, what he'll take us through is you'll see a video, you're going to hear some talks, you're going to hear from our core activities, and then we'll have some engagement. Detlef, over to you. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, a great summary of where we are and, and what WCRP, the new WCRP will look like. Um, and without any further ado, we actually want to get into details now. And uh, the next session, uh, session three, um, it, it, the, the title is WCRP Advancing Climate Science Achievements, Impacts and Outlook. And that really uh, puts it together, summarizes it, what we want to um, achieve here in this session. It's about one hour. And um, so uh, achievements, we want to start with achievements. Um, we are um, past the, our 40 years anniversary. And um, uh, in the context of the 40, um, 40th anniversary, we actually made a little um, movie. It's only three minutes long. And we thought it might be useful to start with this um, movie to introduce WCRP um, at least, um, or, or the way it, it, it acted in the past, um, because much of that, in fact, will continue before we then get into the next um, uh, uh, well generation that uh, introduce the lighthouse activities and also provide more um, information about the core activities uh, and also give you a chance for uh, questions and answers at the end. Um, so, uh, Helen, please go ahead and launch the video. Climate ever-changing and evolving. It shapes our planet and where we live, what we do, our survival. But today, it is changing faster than ever before. In 1979, climate specialists gathered at the first World Climate Conference. Observations provided a new perspective of our planet as an interconnected system of atmosphere ocean, land, and life. The World Climate Research Program, WCRP, was established a year later. It provides a platform for international collaboration
to understand the evolution of our climate system and the influence that humans have on Earth. WCRP's work has provided the foundation for some of the most ambitious international climate treaties and policies impacting life on Earth. Looking to the future, WCRP's new strategic plan will focus on four core objectives which will look to support and facilitate the advancement of science through an understanding of the climate system to push the boundaries of predictions to better understand climate across all system components. To assess the long-term responses, feedbacks and uncertainties around our changing climate. And to bridge the gap between climate science and society by supporting innovation and knowledge around our Earth system. Over the past 40 years, this international network of passionate individuals has given its time and energy in pursuit of answers to the most complex scientific challenges on Earth. As we welcome a new generation of scientists to the field, WCRP will continue to facilitate the international coordination of climate research that is needed to support a more resilient society. The story is not over yet, and the answers arrived at by science are clear. Our climate has changed and will continue to change. We must continue to bring the world's best research to the table to meet the challenges and take advantage of the opportunities to come. Back over to you, Detlef. Thank I'll you, just, Helen. Um, I'll stop sharing now. Uh, yes, um, I think this is a wonderful overture into the future. And um, what we want to do now is, in fact, building on 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 this introduction of the new strategy, um, and uh, uh, present to you four of our um, lighthouse new uh, lighthouse activities. Um, I would like to start um, or add one sentence to Helen's wonderful summary. Um, the idea behind the lighthouse activities was that um, while going forward and implementing, in fact, the new strategy, we thought about, I mean, the urgency, in fact, um, in climate research, in providing answers. And we also thought about um, what kind of big steps forward can we actually initiate, um, like a, a large a global experiment and so forth. And that was really the idea behind the lighthouse activities that we integrate, that we, in fact, um, uh, perform inter, uh, interdisciplinary research that we will provide um, um, gateways and interfaces to our partners to do this together. This is where the co-design comes in. And, and so each of these lighthouse activities are really thought to be a big experiment, a big problem, solving a big step forward and providing answers. And with this, I would like to now turn over to the first um, presentation by Gabi Hegel, um, the, it's on the um, safe landing uh, climate. Um, and um, uh, Gabi, you have 10 minutes and we will give you a two minute warning. I cannot hear Gabi. I'm not sure about everybody else. Can you hear me now? Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, ah, I, I hear you and I see the slides. Oh, that's a good combination. <laughs> good morning, And if you everybody. go into presenter mode, it's also good. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to present the Safe Landing um, Lighthouse to you, which is led by Steve Sherwood and myself and has a team um, of um, several uh, scientists across continents. Um, and um, so um, Pascal Bracanon, Pierre Friedlingstein, Heiko Gölzer, um, Neil Harris and Beth Holland, um, 
Jung Jung Kim and Paul Palmerbrill and Betty Botrisner and Reed and Kevin Reed and Tim Renwick. Um, so we and we we envisage um, what we envisage by safe landing is something akin to the Hudson River landing. So we are um, as a as a planetary system, we are on a journey that is um, a dangerous one, and we um, we are trying to arrive at um, at a, at a, la a landing point or at um, or a destination in terms of mitigation where um, we can as much as possible will be um, saved. Um, and we have um, developed this topic into um, five um, particularly interesting topics we want to look at um, from this point of view. And I'm going to um, introduce these topics on the next slide. So the first um, topic is um, what is safe landing? What is um, what? Um, which is um, very much the question about what needs to be avoided. So um, we bring together an interdisciplinary group of communities and um, look at um, metrics of, of, of climate and biodiversity and um, on relevant timescales and look at um, both um, safe landing from an arrival or destination point of view and a pathways point of view and a framework in where um, we can um, decide or um, where we, for a framework for what for identifying what is actually an acceptable pathway and what is a dangerous pathway. We have um, multiple partners on this particular topic, and it is a very much an open ended topic right now that is being informed by web consultation. So we invite experts and talk, um, for example, the um, burning ember people and talk about um, what um, has to be avoided and what is um, and, and what is um, reasonably safe, relatively safe. Uh, um, so topic one is kind of an almost an overarching topic for um, um, for all the other topics. Um, the second topic focuses on tail risks and extremes. So we would like to identify and characterize um, key tail risks and extremes that we need to avoid. So this is um, um, tipping points um, in a relatively broad sense. Um, um, so where we have a, a rapid transition to a less habitable system, we are also looking at the risk of high climate sensitivity, quantifying the, the risk of sensitivity being higher than we in the moment expect. Um, look at a risk of large scale, very extreme events, um, such as um, extreme fire activity, um, um, heat that um, is unsurvivable by humans over uh, parts of important parts of the biosphere. We um, look at um, we 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 aim to facilitate the incorporate cooperation of these risks into future projections and and um, to enable a research focus on these risks um, and also um, look at cost benefit analysis and um, examine how and if tail risks can be mitigated or avoided. So we we have again partners in these activities that are listed below. And in the moment, we are pushing this forward by um, by web presentations um, again, um, but not consultations, but presentations of um, groups that work in this area. The, the third topic is temporarily called land and carbon, even though we have just identified that some of the carbon uh, topics are not involved, not on land. So it's under discussion if we go for a broader um, for, for a broader headline. Um, um, among topics we are thinking about are the climate implications of carbon dioxide removal and um, including the land um, surface um, impacts of, um, of large scale biofuels. Um, we um, look at the contribution by other forces um, to mitigation, um, assess the risks of um, surprises and rapid changes in greenhouse gases due to land sources like um, permafrost or um, collapse of um, ecosystems, in, for example, in, in the tropics. Um, and um, we are um, drawing on the Carbon Cycle Grand Challenge for this, and uh, again, a lot of um, other groups in, in the World Climate Research Program. So if you don't understand all the acronyms, I, I, I think the acronyms are one of the challenges of the World Climate Research Program. It's, it's like the most acronym rich area I know. So don't worry too much about it. It's just a lot, uh, it's just groupings that are um, dealing with particular topics relevant here. The, the fourth topic is water availability. Um, the aim of a, of, of a lighthouse activity is not to solve everything, but to identify a few areas where we need to make rapid progress. So 
um, this topic is still in the definition phase of trying to find uh, to find out where we are going. Um, we, uh, two topics are um, have been identified as possibly um, really interesting and important. One is um, mount, uh, is water involved in mountain glaciers and snowpacks, um, and the other one is the um, role of the tropical rainforests in the water cycle, and um, on the other hand, the water cycle in maintaining them. Um, in the moment, it looks like we are um, looking into both topics um, for now. And the fifth topic, a very important topic for safe landing climates is sea level. As we know, um, sea level will increase rising. And um, so and, um, and, and so we are uh, trying to identify how um, what levels of sea level um, rise can be adapted to uh, to re um, re retain habitable coasts. Um, we are looking at its irreversible irreversibility, um, estimates the impact on low elevation lands and communities, um, storm surges, um, the interaction with storm surges, hurricanes, so changes in the atmosphere, and assess the potential for adaptation. Um, and this is um, then a drawing on the grand challenge on, on sea level. And so what we are doing right now is we develop a science plan by June, which is um, already here. <laughs> so we are developing our science plan, have um, have proposed an AGU session for this lighthouse, so where we invite the scientific contributions that are relevant, um, also to broaden the discussion. Um, we'll aim for a white paper um, and are doing our webinar series and virtual discussions um, to push this um, agenda forward. I think that's me. So should I stop sharing? Sorry. Um... Yes, uh, please stop sharing. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks also for staying on time. And um, we would actually hold or ask you to hold questions or put them already into Slido. We will, in fact, address the questions after we heard um, uh, all the, all the um, presentations. And um, in that sense, we would st uh, continue straight. Um, thanks again, Gabi, and go now to Andrew Charlton Perez. And um, the next presentation is, in fact, on the WCRP Academy. I can imagine that many people are very curious about uh, what this academy is. Um, and so, Andrew, please go ahead. OK, thanks, Detlef. Um, could someone just confirm they can sleep, see my slides? And, and it's all wonderful. Me? Yes, Great. thank you. Fantastic. Um, OK, so um, on we go. So um, it, I think it's really important to say, first of all, that uh, the, the academy is is rather different to the other lighthouses, which have very kind of strong um, science um, foci. And as Helen mentioned, it's really important here for us that the WCRP, WCRP Academy is a cross-cutting initiative that goes across those lighthouses, goes across the core programs and all the great work that WCRP does. So the motivation for us is really kind of strongly focused around training for climate science. And we kind of start from a set of core principles. Um, so I think, you know, as we've seen in the film and, and heard earlier today, it's clear that, you know, we need climate expertise now more, more than ever. Um, and that climate expertise is particularly needed um, in countries which are most vulnerable to the negative impacts of, of climate change. And Although there is, of course, a lot of, of really excellent climate science training, I'm sure many of you on the uh, on the call today work in institutions which have really excellent climate science programs. Um, I, I think that there is still a, a gap between um, the people who need that training um, and the people who can provide it. And, and this is really the key role that we see the, the academy fulfilling. And, and we think that essentially the academy could make uh, this access to training more efficient, more sustainable, generate new opportunities by connecting people who want to be trained with people who can provide training. I think a huge frustration for all of us who are involved in the academy is just um, the amount of effort that, that many of us and many of our colleagues have gone into in, in terms of generating really excellent training resources, which are perhaps delivered once or twice to small groups of people um, and and don't really have the, the full impact, don't really land with the people who we who we think they should. So this leads me on to thinking about the kind of barriers to, to making our climate science training better. Um, and, and this was a focus of our own initial discussions when we first um, set up our science team. So I think we we you know fairly quickly identified a number of barriers which we think are are very important here. So 
Um, the first one of those is that uh, we already heard today about how much the, the field of climate science is changing, new technologies, um, new approaches to climate science are, are kind of springing up all the time. And I think we're aware that, that there, in, there is no one institution that can really provide the complete training that we think um, you know, the next generation of climate scientists really require. And I think we also kind of link to that, and this links to some of the other lighthouses. We think that um, obviously the, the links of, of climate variability and change to impacts is, uh, and impacts on society is, are so important, and we need to ensure that our climate researchers have training um, in that area. Then when we think about barriers, I think we, we quickly decided that um, the main barriers to access are, are, are kind of not really about a lack of prior training or a desire for training, but they're really around um, having that training available to you in a place where you could easily access it and take part in it. And part of those barriers then become financial. And I think we, in our vision for what the kind of future training landscape for um, climate science looks like, I think we are aware that, that that needs to be through a variety of different funding mechanisms. So it needs to be um, kind of our traditional approach here is um, people get government grants and they, and they go and train to be climate researchers. Sometimes that training is funded by institutions, um, but I think we also think that there are other mechanisms, for philanthropic mechanisms, and obviously people taking the training, paying for that training, which is kind of an important part of that, that ecosystem. And then finally, the thing I guess that we've all realized in, in the last year is that um, there's just so much more that we can do online than perhaps we had, had thought before. Um, and so trying to make the training at the scale we're, we're imagining here requires um, delivery both online and in person. So there are benefits to, to both approaches to training uh, and perhaps blended approaches are, are really the, uh, the, the ones that, that, that will be the most successful uh, for the future. So, um, our focus then is, is in thinking about the WCRP Academy as a kind of marketplace for climate science training. Um, so we, we kind of think there's a role here, an important role for the WCRP in brokering um, the training between people who can provide it, who have the expertise locked up in our institutions uh, and, and the researchers who need access to that training. And so um, we kind of see the Academy as having two important roles here. So the, the first is to provide a simple hub where people can go to, to advertise, to, to seek uh, participants in their training courses, whatever that might be, longer term courses, shorter courses. Um, and so the link between the training providers and the climate researchers. And so that web hub will be a, a, a very important um, plank of, of what the Academy will do. The second is that, of course, we need we all need to understand where the gaps uh, in climate science training are. So what we also imagine is an annual stock take uh, where we go out to the WCRP community and hopefully much broader to understand where the gaps in current training are. And that's helpful both for, for climate researchers. So we, we kind of know that, that, that there are those gaps, but also for our institutions and in giving them the sense that there is a sustainable um, need for training in a certain area and, and will give them the impetus and the confidence to develop that new training. So we kind of have a sort of five to 10 year vision for the academy and thinking about where, where it sits within the climate science uh, landscape. Um, we're currently working on our kind of two year um, setup timeline. And I think our, our first focus is, is really this inward facing focus. So it's really kind of consolidating and and bringing together all of the WCRP training activities. So many of you will have been involved in WCRP seasonal schools, for example. Uh, and so bringing that to one place is, is, a, is a really quick win for us in terms of making that training more accessible to a, to a wider group of people. And then in the long term on this kind of five to 10 year horizon, we, we really hope that we can bring in lots of other training uh, opportunities for, from other providers. It's important to say that we don't imagine the academy here as being a training provider itself. This is a facilitation role. Uh, and that's, I think, something that um, the WCRP does incredibly well. Um, Two minutes so, later. Thank you. Um, so just so you can kind of see um, some of the people who are involved um, in this project, we're, we're very lucky to have a great team of people from around the world who are 
uh, giving their time uh, and their energy to the project. Uh, and, and I just thought it would be useful to put up some of their faces because many of you may know uh, some of the people. I think some of the people that are even on the call today. Um, so if you want to talk more to somebody who's already involved in this process, then please, please do um, uh, talk to talk to those people. Um, so I wanted to leave by thinking about how you might um, get involved. So the, the really important thing that we're doing right now is we're just developing our first stock take survey. So we almost are ready to go with that. Um, so please do look out for that survey coming around to you from WCRP or from uh, from from many other uh, angles uh, in in the next month or so. Um, and we really want to make sure that um, we encourage everyone to try and try and input to that survey. Obviously, we we will live and die on on the strength of the the response we get from the community. So we really want to make sure, particularly in this first. Uh, survey that we we really get a good sample uh, of the community and their needs. So please do participate in that and share it among your networks when you can. Um, what we also hope to do then is to publish the results of that in a, in a fairly open forum, perhaps in BAMS or, or in a WCRP newsletter. So please do look out for those results so you can kind of see uh, what the needs are. And then uh, just finally, um, we are we have three working groups and we're always looking for new members of those, particularly for those who have expertise in working with philanthropic donors or setting up nonprofit organizations. So if you are interested in, in taking part, we're, we're very open to, to new participants. Please do do contact Narelle or contact me uh, and we can we can get you involved in the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a, a wonderful presentation summary. Um, and again, please um, put your questions into Slido. Um, we will come back to these questions and we would continue from here um, to the next presentation. I heard that actually my video might not be visible to everybody, um, maybe the others as well, um, but uh, I hope so. I hope it will turn out um, good. Um, the next presentation is by Ted Shepard, um, who will actually um, talk about the uh, My Climate Risk Lighthouse activity. Ted, go ahead. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can uh, see your screen and good, your thanks. video as well. All right, thanks. So, um, just the uh, in my climate risk, uh, the sorry for all the all the text uh, on this page. In terms of the vision, um, we're 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 uh, we're not talking about models or observations or process understanding on their own, but rather bringing them together. And we're we're interested in climate risk at the very local scale. So we use the phrase deep. Uh, uh, Uncertainty, which has some some technical meanings in certain communities, there's of course various layers of depth. But we could just say where we don't, where you don't know what's what's going to happen in a way that can be represented, let's say at the high, medium to high confidence le level of WCRP with a quantified with a quantified uh, 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 uncertainty at the local scale. We're usually dealing with either the the, the low confidence end or the things that are 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 not set set at all. Um, the goal is, as Helen said in the original outline, is 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 to to, to develop and and mainstream, especially a, a bottom up approach to regional climate risk, which is starting not from the climate information, but the other end from the the, the decision context and the decision scale, and enables the relevant climate information to be brought into that context. Of course, these this kind of thing is happening in various places, but I think it's fair to say it's not the traditional approach. Certainly. With, with my physics background, which I think a lot of us have similar background in, in WCRP, it completely goes against the, the, the grain of a grand unified theory and so on. The, the purpose is to develop a framework for assessing and explaining the physically plausible climate drivers of regional climate risk. So there, that's where, where the processes come in, in terms of the physical plausibility. Um, we feel that's a way to make climate information meaningful at the local scale, which is very important in terms of the emotional engagement with the information. And al although any application of the framework will clearly be specific and be very tailored to local concerns, the idea, of course, is to have a, a, a framework itself, which is much more ge generic and, and, and flexible and can be applied to different region types. We're not doing, we're, we're certainly not going to be pro providing climate services, but we're but we're trying to underpin the, the research and the support for the development of climate services, and we, and we want to do this in, in uh, regional labs. Um, my co-chair, Regina 
Rodriguez from Brazil gave this example early on in her discussion. She she's she's an oceanographer from from the Clavar community, but she was asked by um, a local energy company in Brazil after a drought some questions, and and it just uh, exemplified to her the kinds of questions that a WCRP scientist, uh, especially in the, in 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 a, le a less wealthy country, might be asked by various stakeholders. So the energy company. Wants to know about drought over maybe a 20 year time frame, um, next couple of decades. The the water supply company is taking a longer per perspective, maybe maybe uh, five decades. But the farmers are interested on on the seasonal time scale. So how do we help a re re researcher who has some climate experience engage with this range of stakeholders? And our our goal really is to empower uh, climate scientists in in developing countries to become the local experts and support the. the the development of homegrown climate services rather than imported climate services from from the wealthy countries. Uh, this is our our team. As I said, Regina is my co chair from from Clivar. I don't have an official WCRP tag anymore, but I but I used to be very involved in Spark. Spark is my spiritual home in some ways. Um, the the uh, the the formation of the of the team was uh, through a process that was internal, and therefore we we we've inherited some of the um, regional representation um, uh, challenges that exist within WCRP. You can see that Western Europe is is extremely well represented, uh, but Western Asia or Eastern Europe, for that matter, are not. And there's a lot a lot of part, parts of the world that that, that that are not well worth. Represented, we've been trying to fill in some of those gaps slowly. There will be a, 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 a transition and a renewal of the team. This is a, a transition team. We're certainly counting on a number of people to continue, but equally, we we will have have some um, new membership. So we're certainly keen to grow grow the activity. Um, just to lay out some of the challenges. Uh, one of the challenges is as soon as you get into the local risk, and you're talking about the non-hazard aspects of risk. Uh, this is, of course, a huge and very complex scope, which is well beyond the WCRP expertise itself. There's, a, in some ways, a, a, a overlapping scope with uh, a, a little bit with the other lighthouses, although mainly, I would say, with the homes and uh, especially rifts. So we have to think about that. And um, the demand is just how do we make progress, get, given given the ever increasing demands on people's time, in, in, in particular during the COVID pandemic, which, of course, is not, not over yet. Um, so the solutions on on, on the complexity side is to work in specific risk applications with end users in a bottom up approach, which we call labs, where the climate scientists would typically be a minority of those groups. Um, and I think we have to develop partnerships with institutes, which can act as regional hubs and, and provide continuity, because um, there has to be some sort of uh, continuity there. Um, one of the challenges in a lot of these areas is that the work has been funded from short term research grants, which to start and then stop and then and then everything falls apart afterwards. The overlapping part, of course, we are drawing on all relevant parts of the WCRP filling gaps and building on what is already working well. We're certainly not a, a silo. Uh, we expect people to be wearing multiple hats and actually we expect especially strong link, I think, with the academy because um, training is really a big, big, big part of the challenge of this landscape. And uh, our, uh, the, the approach is developing an ecosystem of research clusters rather than a hierarchical structure, which is perhaps the more traditional WCRP approach. Uh, in terms of demand, I think it's important to distinguish what needs to be done and the role of the, of the WCRP within that. Those are different, um, and we have to focus on what WCRP can do. Obviously, there are many, the, 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 the scope is, is huge. Um, another challenge is equity and uh, Legitimacy, I think that's especially, of course, it's a challenge for the entire WCRP, but I think it's especially the, the, the case for this lighthouse activity and um, draw your attention to the paper by Vincent et al. recently talking about the um, North-South par partnerships, which all, often are born out of a paradigm of not knowledge deficit and capacity development. And we really have to change that if we're going to succeed. And I've been inspired by E.F. Schumacher's um, famous books, so Small is Beautiful. It's on economics and it's on te technology and physical infrastructure, but I think a lot of the same concepts apply to science and information. Um, and he talks about the fact that production methods should be used in wor workplaces located where people live now, cheap, relatively simple, using local materials and mainly for local use. And just as 
as Andrew has talked about for 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 the academy. It doesn't have to mean simple, of course. I mean, a, a, we have a lot of, um, you know, uh, so smartphones and various uh, 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 software, which which is is not simple. But if it's simple to use, and if people can access the worldwide storehouse of information and knowledge in the WCRP, then that's then that uh, can enable a lot of things at the local scale. So finally, um, we have a session at the Sustainability Re Research and Innovation Co Congress, which is starting. Um, at the end of this uh, week, actually, um, we have a session submitted for the AGU fall meeting, and we're we're developing workshops uh, with the Himalayan University Co Consortium, which is part of ISIMOD, um, with Eurocortex, with the UN Ocean Decade, and we're looking for other other collaborations, and of course various partnerships, um, including the regional focal points as here. So if you'd like to become engaged in this, if it makes sense for you, if you think that. Um, it aligns with the uh, ambitions for your local situation. Please get in touch. Thank, thank you very, very much. Thanks a lot, Ted. Um, excellent uh, presentation. Um, uh, as before, if you have questions, please put them into Slido, and we will come back to those. All the speakers will actually be able, available to answer questions. Um, we would come now to the last lighthouse presentation. Um, this is not all the lighthouses uh, that we, in fact, um, have created. Um, uh, Helen already alluded to this, um, but um, the, the last one here being presented is now by Rowan Sutton, and he will actually give the lighthouse a title himself. Rowan, please go ahead. I cannot hear you. I see your slide, though. Right, there we go. You can hear me now. No, I can hear you now. Good. Okay. Thanks very much. So um, it's my pleasure to present the Lighthouse activity on explaining and uh, predicting our system change uh, on behalf of myself and my co-chair, that's Kirsten Findell from the US and the whole uh, science team. Um, okay, just doing the slide change here. That's not responding. There we go. Um, so just to start with a with a a figure on the right here this is a nice figure from Ed Hawkins which shows uh surface temperature change on a global scale at the top and then for a, a a local station Oxford and what it shows of course is the emergence of the signal of anthropogenic climate change against the background of natural variability which is what the shaded colors are in in both these two figures and of course you can see the signal of warming very very clearly on the global scale uh, less clearly on the local scale, but nonetheless, we do see this uh, very clear emergence of the signal, even at, at a single station such as Oxford now, because the signal has become so strong. So the broad picture here is that the signal of anthropogenic climate change is becoming increasingly apparent on smaller and smaller scales and across a wider range of variables. Uh, so not just temperatures, of course, but uh, changes in the hydrological cycle, for example, and, and many, many uh, variables that impact uh, societies in many different ways. However, our ability to uh, explain this emerging signal in quantitative terms, uh, understand what exactly is the anthropogenic signal and what might be natural variability, is still pretty primitive. And that's especially the, the case when we look at variables like uh, atmosphere and ocean circulation. Uh, which are, of course, uh, tremendously important. So this is the uh, motivation for this lighthouse activity to to understand and explain the changes that are taking place, particularly on multi-annual to decadal time scales. <laughs> and we need to do that because in order to uh, adapt to climate change, to understand what uh, current risks may be and how risks may be changing, we need to be able to quantify this emerging signal of climate change uh, in, in all the variables that are potentially uh, impactful. So um, <clears throat> that, that, that context leads to the overarching objective for this lighthouse activity, which is stated here, to design and take major steps toward delivery of an integrated capability for quantitative observation, explanation, early warning and prediction of Earth system change with a focus on global to regional scales and multi-annual to decadal time scales. So in terms of our relationship to the other lighthouse activities, as we've heard Ted uh, talking about my climate risk, the focus is more there on, on local scales. So we're looking at larger scales here. 
and in relation to safe landing climates, their focus is more on the multi-decadal to centennial timescales, whereas we are focusing on the multi-annual to decadal uh, time window. And a note there that, that the challenges around understanding changes in ocean atmosphere circulation and their influence on hazards are a particular focus. And that's, that's, uh, those issues are particularly important for adaptation uh, to climate change. Um, <clears throat> looking at some of the uh, gaps that we would like to address and some of the headline outputs, therefore, that we would like to come out of this activity, uh, many of you will be familiar with these headline reports that are produced on a regular basis, uh, the State of the Climate reports, uh, and a, a relatively recent innovation is the WMO Global Annual to Decadal Climate Update, which is a, uh, an outlook for the years ahead. Now, these are very important reports, but actually they contain almost no information uh, that seeks to explain what has happened recently. You know, do we understand the changes that have uh, been observed? Uh, on on multi-annual decadal timescales, I I could have mentioned uh, on the on the earlier slide the the hiatus in global mean surface temperature, which many people will remember when global surface temperatures did not rise significantly for around a decade. There was huge debate at that time about well, what did this tell us about the emerging signal of of climate change? And the fact that there was huge debate tells us that in fact our capabilities were pretty primitive. So there's a huge amount to do, and because that's just global mean temperature, and of course we need to be able to explain changes on, on, on regional scales, which is much more challenging. Um, <clears throat> another example of the kind of output that we would like to see coming out of our lighthouse activity is uh, this illustration, which quantifies. Uh, this is looking at the density of tropical tropical cyclone tracks. Now, we know that tropical cyclones are influenced by both natural variability in the climate system and anthropogenic climate change. Uh, but, but exactly how those factors are affecting um, <clears throat> both the distribution of these hazards and the characteristics of these hazards, for example, their intensity, is something that is still rather poorly understood. So this is a great challenge for research. So the structure of our lighthouse activity is uh, illustrated in this diagram. In order to address this sort of central challenge of integrated attribution, prediction, and projection, uh, we need to look to uh, three sorts of inputs. We need to monitor and observe the changes that are unfolding. We need models to interpret those changes and to anticipate the future. And of course, we need process understanding to ensure uh, that we have solid foundations uh, for everything that we're doing. And then on the right hand side of this diagram, the outputs that that we look to are that will be important for society. Uh, on the one hand, we need to quantify uh, current and future hazards, such as the tropical cyclones I mentioned. And in addition, we need to provide early warnings about changes that are unfolding. We have organized our lighthouse activity into three themes or working groups uh, illustrated there. So one uh, focuses on observing and monitoring uh, and modeling the system. A second one focuses on the, the core challenge of integrated attribution, prediction and projection, uh, including early warning. And the third group focuses on the assessment of current and future hazards. Uh, <clears throat> just one slide here to illustrate some of the uh, emerging aspects of our science plan, which will be uh, completed uh, shortly. So in this first theme, uh, and in fact, across all three themes, we have, uh, we believe that research focused on particular case studies. I gave the example of, of the hiatus for global mean temperature, but if one thinks about uh, ch changes on regional scales, these case studies might involve particular long lived events like droughts, or they might involve significant uh, uh, trends in the climate system. There are still challenges such as, for example, multi-decadal variability in the North Atlantic Oscillation that have been challenges for a long time for our community still unsolved. Uh, so this, this type of focus we think will be important. Um, the, the way in which we look to the, the observing system is really very important here. So questions like, to, do we have an observing system which is adequate for explaining uh, and then predicting a system change? is, is, a, is a, a huge question, but extremely important for our lighthouse activity and how we use that observing system with models 
uh, with climate models through uh, data simulation, for example. Again, there's a huge set of challenges in that area. In the third theme, in the second theme, sorry, um, we've highlighted here the need in order to do attribution and quantitative attribution, um, one needs uh, experiments with different forcings. And in particular, we've highlighted here the need for large ensemble experiments with single forcings. So just for example, with solar variability or uh, just with greenhouse gases. Um, <clears throat> and obviously we also need experiments with those forcings in combinations to look at interactions. Um, Circulation change I mentioned earlier is a particular challenge here, and some people will be familiar with the interesting, fascinating literature really around the signal to noise paradox, which suggests that in fact the real world in terms of circulation change is more predictable than we thought, which is a fantastic opportunity, but also a real challenge because we don't know why. Um, <clears throat> then in the third area, um, I gave uh, an example here of, of the sort of outputs that we're looking looking to, but understanding the decadal variability in classes of events like tropical hazard, like tropical cyclones, and and how that variability is influenced by natural and anthropogenic drivers is a key key challenge here. Uh, this this area is really pushing the absolute frontiers of computational capabilities. So the interaction with the digital Earth's activity will be important here because really we need very large ensembles and we need the highest possible resolutions that are that are achievable. Um, and, and this is an area where we would like to see collaboration with uh, my climate risks so that we can use some of the information about changing hazards in conjunction with uh, other information to inform decision making. Um, my last slide is to um, advertise the workshop. So we have a, a, a major workshop coming up in September. There's an abstract submission deadline at the end of June. We really invite uh, as many people as possible to get involved in this workshop. So this is focusing on our core challenge of, of attributing multi-annual to decadal changes in the climate system. And it's gonna be a really uh, exciting workshop and we look forward to uh, lots of engagement. You can see the website there at the bottom of the slide. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Rowan. And again, uh, excellent, excellent presentation. Um, uh, we before we actually come to a, a session where we um, answer your um, questions, um, we of course would like to also to highlight um, the work that uh, will go on in the core project. And we should remember the lighthouse activities are being carried forward and co-owned by the core activities um, core project of WCRP. And for this purpose, we have pre um, prepared now. Um, uh, uh, short video presentations um, from three of the core projects and to two of our flagship activities. Um, so this is, will be now from Clivar, GVEX, Spark, and CMIP and Codex. And I ask now Helen to launch the presentation. Thank you, Detlef. I'm going to first check you can hear me okay? I can hear you, yes. And you should see our Clivar opening slide. Yes, I do. Great, okay. Hopefully this will work. Hello to the WCRP Climate Research Forum, and thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what the Clivar Atlantic Regional Panel is doing. One of our recent activities has been to create the Clivar AMOC Task Team, which seeks to advance scientific understanding about the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. What is the AMOC? It's shown in the schematic on the right as a simplified view of the ocean circulation in the Atlantic, where red ribbons indicate warm waters moving northwards in the top thousand meters of the ocean, including the Gulf Stream, and blue ribbons show cold waters moving southward below. And so this northward water above and southward water below is what we refer to as the overturning circulation. So why do we care about the AMOC? In general terms, it's important for climate variability and predictability. And as a couple of examples, the panel on the left shows what happens in a simulated world after the AMOC circulation was shut down. These are temperature patterns 100 years later, and you see a cold blob, a blue blob, over the northern North Atlantic and Europe, even while the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the world has warmed up. Variations in its strength, not just an extreme shutdown, have also been linked to changes in weather patterns, including hurricanes in the Atlantic and drought in the Sahel, shown in the pan panels on the right. 
Recently, there's been a lot of interest in AMOC science and a lot of independent efforts to observe the circulation, shown in the locations on the, in the map on the right. The middle panel shows early results from those efforts, where the time series indicate the strength of the AMOC at each of the observing arrays. And what you can see is that there's a lot of variability, both at the individual observing arrays given by the wiggles in a single line, but also no apparent correspondence between them, so the lines don't move up and down together, which kind of contradicts what we might expect from that simplified schematic view of the circulation pattern on the first slide. So due to the importance of the AMOC in climate and all these independent efforts going into understanding the circulation pattern, it's a great example of where international coordination can really help to advance the field. So the Clivar AMOC task team aims to promote collaboration between observational and modeling communities to advance the science, to identify community priorities, to improve data access, and also to develop strategies for effective observing. It's still early days, but with all the new things we're learning about the AMOC, it's an exciting time. Thank you. Herewith, I'd like to present the GeoX highlights for Europe and Western Asia. We recognize that water is a transdisciplinary problem which affects many aspects of society and requires the expertise of many scientific disciplines. The dependence on water resources and the modes of water uses has changed widely from one region to another. Thus, any transdisciplinary research on the water cycle has to be regional in nature. Today, we'd like to highlight the GWEX Regional Hydroclimate Projects, in short RHPs, which are generally large, regionally focused, multi and transdisciplinary projects that aim to improve the understanding and prediction of that region's weather, climate and hydrology to support the well-being of our society and environment. The RHPs are co-designed with stakeholders and the local research communities and includes improvement and access to observations, data, modeling and their applications. Currently, we have several of these RHPs active in Europe and Eastern and Southeast Asia. The emphasis here is on the interaction of humans with the water cycle and how it will be affected and change on the climate change and what the implications are for water availability, food security, biodiversity and such. In these regional research activities, GEOX supports the coordination and facilitation. We bring to the table expertise on the climate water potential, the knowledge and on meteorological and hydrological processes. And this expertise is then applied to the regional water issues in collaboration with a variety of other disciplines and stakeholders. In these endeavors, we are supported by the full WCRP community, often together with other partner organizations. In Central Asia, we are in the start we are in the process of developing a new RHP together with START and the Mountain Research Initiative and support from CORE GEREX. We aim to first develop the network of researchers and stakeholders, as well as the necessary capacities and interfaces, and see the link on the slide to, to the survey to support our work. In both the Eastern European and Central Asian region, we feel we can do much better and be much better connected to the existing research communities. And we look forward to building together a successful climate research endeavor. And we look forward to your support in that. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi, I'm Neil Harris and I'm one of the co-chairs of Spark. So I'm here today just to give you a little flavor of what we do. There are two main issues we work on. The first is stratospheric ozone depletion. Um, this has been an issue for a long time now in both the scientific and political surface circles and Spark on behalf, with the rest of the scientific community has made a major contribution to the Montreal Protocol, where ozone is now going up, it's recovering as the ozone depleting substances go down in the atmosphere. Further, we've done a lot of work on looking at how the climate links um, between ozone depletion and climate change, how they work and how they come through. It's worth saying in this regard that the savings in terms of climate warming through the Montreal Protocol are much greater than those through any of the climate negotiations so far. 
There are still ongoing issues. It's not a, a completely solved issue yet. And these include the recent unreported CFC level emissions, which now are thankfully decreasing. The second major issue we look at is obviously climate change. And we look at both the dynamical variability within the atmosphere and the atmospheric composition. An example of what we do with the atmospheric variability can be seen in the recent Australian bushfires. It was found out that the stratosphere had a major role in predetermining the conditions for the bushfires, hot, dry, and that, that means there's a degree of predictability that can be um, applied to this in future. This can be further linked through a teleconnection back to the Indian Ocean. The second role is that of the, uh, is the composition, both CO2, the non-CO2 gases, and also aerosols, including the volcanic aerosols seen on the left. I hope this brief talk has given you a flavor of Spark, and I hope the rest of the meeting goes well. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jean-Francois Lamarck, um, and I am the current uh, CIMIP chair. And I'd like to uh, present a few things um, on uh, some of the current results that are coming out of, of the CMIP 6 and just as a reminder of um, all the MIPS and all the scientific targets that CMIP 6 had and uh, this is the picture from the um, airing at all uh, 2016 GMD paper and so in in this uh, myriad of topics that could be uh, described in the little time I have I'd like to focus here on some of the analysis of, of regional uh, phenomena. And in particular, I'd like to use this slide uh, that was provided to me by uh, Malcolm Roberts from the uh, high risk MIP group. And this is really from um, a paper um, by uh, Moreno Chamaro. Um, it is now being it is now accepted and really trying to describe the uh, sensitivity of the results in this in this case and the change in uh, winter time European rainfall uh, over um, the 2030-50 to 1960 from 1960-80 um, and what we can see is the very strong dependence of the results um, on resolution uh, from both on the uh, finer um, sphere resolution uh, going this way and a finer horizontal resolution being this way with a stippling, stippling really indicating where the model uh, with the most uh, the highest resolution are different from any other and part of it is probably related to uh, the position of the jet stream where the highest resolution models are much better at capturing uh, the observational uh, position of uh, the Gulf Stream. So um, this is this is a great um, example of uh, trying to use as much information as we can from both um, the large scale, um, fairly coarse resolution, uh, what is called here LL, low resolution, ocean re low resolution atmosphere models, which is typical what's been used in uh, CIMIP 5 and CIMIP 6, and put that in perspective of uh, what would happen if we had access to much more computing power and uh, the use of high resolution models. So all those regional uh, studies are really uh, critical in providing the information that policymakers would want at the region regional scale, not just at the global scale. And with that, um, I thank you for your attention. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is... Hi, I'm Miriam Locke, the Director of the International Project Office for Cortex. Cortex is the Coordinated Regional Climate Downscaling Experiment, and it spans over most land areas and the Arctic. It's a global effort to advance and coordinate science and application of regional downscaling through global partnerships. We just released the protocol for downscaling of CIMIP 6, and there's a chance to get engaged with Cortex. Would you be interested and want to contact us? Here's the address to the Cortex, uh, project office and the address to our web. Since we're supposed to give a flavor of Cortex today, we'll tell you a bit about our 
uh, flagship pilot studies. These are projects addressing local and regional challenges with large socioeconomic impact and supposed to bridge uh, climate science and society and lead to truly actionable climate information. One of our FPSs is convective phenomena at high resolution over Europe and the Mediterranean. And this is to understand con convective processes and extremes and their local and regional impacts in changing climate. Some outcomes of this is it contrib contributed two papers to the IPCC assessment report six, and it addresses several challenges and outlined in the Cortex white paper that you can find online. Some results from this, this uh, these images show future changes in summer precipitation. And to the left, you have uh, results from the convection permitting regional climate model to the right, uh, the driving regional climate model. And you see much more finer spatial patterns and larger changes. So more intense rains in the convection permitting model that often also better agrees with observations. And this is another example of a, a flagship pilot study. This is a totally fresh one. And they've just had their kickoff meeting online. And here you see the people that were engaged. And this is about understanding how urban areas affect regional climate change and the impact of regional climate change on cities. And since uh, the estimate is that 70% of the uh, world's population will live in cities in, by 2050, this is of great interest. Thank you. Thanks, Detlef. That's the um, that's the sequence of talks. Thank you, yes. and uh, thanks actually to all the speakers so, uh, for the contribution. So I think it will it was important also to hear back from the core activities and what they do. And with this, um, we hope that you now actually have a solid um, uh, basis or information about what WCRP is doing right now. And um, we would open the floor now to comments or questions that you might have. Um, and I hope that um, all of you did actually put uh, questions into Slido. Um, I would, in fact, give Helen now the floor to, uh, to um, read the first important or the first few important questions that we can see who actually might want to answer those. Yes, I will do that. I was just going to put up a, uh, a holding slide while I do that. Um, so we've had some, so keep putting questions in, but we've had a few. I'll go to the most popular one. Um, we've had nine votes for this one. I hope you can hear me okay, Detlef. Yes. So this is actually for the Academy. Um, does the Academy consider training in local language a priority? Is that, do they consider that a priority? Andrew, <laughs> this is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think um, what, one thing that, that hopefully will, will we be able to, to be communicated in the stock take survey, which, as I say, will, will be going out um, shortly, it, it are the kind of priorities that people in the community have like that. So uh, I can certainly see that training in local languages is, is, is very important um, and it should be the, one of the functions of the academy to facilitate that where it's not currently available. Um, and so absolutely put that in the stop take survey, but it's a really good point and we will, we will take that away. Thank you. Thanks okay. very much, Andrew. Sorry. Sorry, Dale, if you go. <laughs> yeah, now go to the next question. <laughs> um, so the next one has actually had one answer, but I'd like, it might be that uh, Ted um, would like to answer it as well. So the question is, um, I think it's from someone called Sam, although also says anonymous. Uh, I see a possible strong overlap between safe landing and my climate risk lighthouses, and perhaps also with the new RIFS core project. How do you plan to deal with such overlaps? Now, Gabby, the um, safe landings uh, leader, had to leave, but Ted may wish to answer that. Yeah, I think I think as as Gabby said, we'll certainly stay in touch. But I I think the the way that the safe landing climates is is really looking at the very long time scale and is connecting with, you know, future Earth activities and ha habitability in general on the kind of um, re regional scale. Um, we're pretty sure that that when we start to look at things in a very local context, that the time that most of the time scales are going to be much shorter. Let's say several decades. Um, um, it, it, in most cases, and in fact, we're trying to bridge from from, from the seasonal out. We, I, I think, our our 
our indication is that is that most people are interested on the seasonal time scale as well, especially let's say in developing countries where thinking 100 year, years ahead in terms of a safe landing climate is kind of a luxury. Um, so I, I don't see that as a ma as a major challenge at all. I think the lighthouses are actually quite complementary in this respect. Thank you, Ted. Um, yes, may maybe uh, we go to then to the next question. Yep, and perhaps I'm going to ask you another one, or this is for you, Ted, but also put Andrew on notice that there's one there for him too. So, so this one is um, for you, Ted. The issue of discontinuity or continuity arising from current approaches to research funding is a major one. Any ideas on how to begin to address it? And I just note that this might actually be a topic for our panel discussion as well. Yes, I think it would be a very good topic for a panel a discussion. I think everybody talks about uh, everyone that I've been engaging with that talks about the that you know the turning the tap on, turning the tap off is just is just crazy. And of course, those of us in Britain know this because of the UK government's uh, de decision about o overseas aid too, which was not just off, but off in the past. <laughs> anyway, um, so we definitely have to build ways of doing things that don't depend 100% on the funding because funding is intermittent, it, it comes and goes. Not to say that funding wouldn't be, wouldn't be involved, of course, but that they have to have long-term continuity. That's why we've, we've actually, t um, we, we didn't envisage this originally, but I think um, it, it, it might climb a risk, but I think we do need um, institutes that can basically step forward and act as regional hubs. And there could be many such hubs, which provide some sort of continuity. And I think that the training will also be part of the continuity, because I think actually when you talk about bringing climate information into a local context under deep uncertainty, that is research itself actually and training. So the two are, I think, two sides of the same coin. It's not that the research is done, done by one set of people and then the training is done by a, a different set of people. So I think that, um, I ho hope that helps. Andrew, do you want to join in? Andrew, I, I, Andrew. I, I... Yeah, I'll let Andrew do that, but I was also, I'll just read out the question for him as well. You might have read it already in Slido about whether you've got plans to integrate training programs that have already been developed in the course of EG EU projects. Um, I, I was just gonna gonna agree very much with what Ted said, and I, and I think um, you know have, having a, a better um, trained climate science base is is critical to to advocating also for that that continued funding, isn't it? It's it's about having um, you know lots lots of great scientists who can who can advocate clearly for that long term funding um, on integrating the training. Um, absolutely, uh, I, I want to. I want to be clear that that the academy, in no sense, would own any of the training. Um, it, it's really a facilitation role that we're imagining for the academy. But but one of the things that we would hope is that um, where excellent training has been developed by by EU projects, which is which is often the case, um, that that there is then a long term um, sustainable future for that training, and so. Um, that's why we see the this, the stock take as being an important part of what we do because it will make clear to the people who have developed that training that actually there is uh, a number of people who want to set that training in the long term, be they 20, 30, 40 people, and that gives you as as the training provider the opportunity to think about what your financial model needs to be for five, ten years in the future um, to to make sure that that training is 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 sustainable. Thank you, Andrew. Just just. Uh... Maybe it's just me, but uh, to to avoid confusion, stock take is being used nowadays in several ways. And one is, for instance, in the UNFCCC, um, stock take on carbon, heat, and so forth. So that's not what Andrew means here. It's actually a stock take on the educational side. That's correct. Yeah. Thanks, Ellen. Andrew. Um, I've got one for um, for Rowan now. Um, and I've just got to find it. Here we go. Um, so, is there a role envisaged for regional climate models or regional earth system models in the explaining and predicting earth system change lighthouse, or do you focus only on global modeling tools? Rowan, you are muted. Oh, okay. and just what, sorry. sorry, Rowan, just yeah. before you get started, I've just seen a note come in from chat that maybe if the questioners could put their camera on so we can see who they are. Um, sorry, Rowan, back to you. Thanks, Helen. Yeah, um, we see the primary focus in our lighthouse activity as as being on on global models. 
but as I indicated, particularly in that in that third theme about quantifying hazards and, and how they're changing, we're absolutely looking to collaborate with other relevant communities, and that would include um, RIFs and, and My Climate Risk. Thank right. you. Um, I'm going to try and get in two more questions, and then we will go to the survey, and we'll we'll have a bit of a break then as well, so you can do the survey or go to the bathroom or stretch your legs, whatever. But I'm going to try and get two more questions in. Um, this one didn't get a lot of votes, but I wanted to. And I've got to find it again now. They keep moving. <laughs> it was about water, and it was from someone who is wanting to get. So this is for you, Jan from GWEX. Um, they were saw the Central Asia. Um, yes, here it is. I heard about the new initiative on water cycle change in Central Asia and was wondering about how to join that uh, this initiative. Yes, thank you very much for the question. So um, as for all the regional hydro climate ex uh, experiments we are we have uh, supporting or encouraging from within GWEX, we really uh, want the, the regional community to come together, formulate their questions, try to write a kind of, of white paper on what they think the most relevant um, research would be for the region. So we are currently exploring uh, the, um, the uh, academic landscape within that region and trying to identify who could be the people who who we could uh, encourage to come together. So in order to get uh, involved, the best would be to write to Peter van Hooverland at the GUX uh, project office and um, and propose your, your help or your knowledge about the scientific community of the region. Helen, if I may, there is another question regarding uh, anthropogenic changes in the water cycle. Mm -hmm which I saw earlier, and that is indeed a very important question for GWEX. So we consider that, especially at the regional scale, the water resources and the impact of climate change on the water resources cannot be dissociated from our water management and water usage. And so we are very much encouraging the GWEX community to look at both aspects, the climate change and the water usage, and to come up with uh, detection and attribution algorithm and methodologies to try and identify understand both in order to be able in the future to integrate that process in our system um, uh, models global or regional and be able to predict the water resources under the combined influence of climate and human water usage thanks jan um if you don't mind detlef i'll keep running through the questions. I'm only going to do two more. There's lots coming in, but uh, we're going to need to move on. I wanted to note there's a, a question from Elena on the temporal focus for safe landing climates, which Gabby has already provided a written answer to. But I think we might have pages online. Um, so I just wanted to give them a chance to, if they wanted to add anything to that comment about um, um, the, the paleo climate work or anyone else that would like to address that question, maybe Pascal as well. Pascal, so, of course, good. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So just wanted to give that opportunity for someone if they wanted to respond. Uh, I could have, Neil Harris, if Pascal's not there, I'm, I'm on that as well. Just the go aim ahead. is very much to include yeah, paleo ahead. climate. Okay. Um, because the whole, a lot of the point of safe landing is to look at time scales beyond what we think the models are necessarily very good at. So yeah, yeah. using paleoclimate or other long term records is really important. Great, thanks, Neil. And I'm going to reserve the last question for Detlef as chair. That's uh, from one of our colleagues, Detlef. Um, it didn't wasn't addressed to anyone, so that's why I'm addressing it to you, Detlef. Where would you see the balance in the new WCRP between the fundamental understanding of the climate system versus uh, answers in the context of mitigation and adaptation of climate change? Well, the, the, it, it's, it's not that easy to answer, but um, WCRP stands for basic uh, uh, research, uh, for basic um, knowledge generation. And that's why one of our objective um, on this very specific topic is number one, on the other hand, um, the as you said in in the in the second session, the 
developing actual knowledge um, uh, is is absolutely important. And so um, if one would give it a ratio, maybe it's 50-50, um, but you cannot actually give actionable information without the basic knowledge. And in that sense, um, it number one priority remains for WCRP, the generation of this basic knowledge would be my answer. Of course, I can give you the question back as a vice chair to see what your answer would be. Um, and I would like to talk about it, but I think your answer is just fine. And I'm also conscious that we would like to get to the survey. So um, let's let's move to the survey. And if we, um, I don't know that we have any many other opportunities, but maybe in the panel discussion, this might come up again as well. Yes. So yeah. um, so I think uh, I th I think. Um, and there might be some discussion happening in Slido anyway. So what I'd like to do now is move from the questions to the Slido survey. So uh, hopefully we will get the technology to work. Next slide, please. There we go. So here we're, like, we're asking for you, dear audience, <laughs> to give us some feedback on what you've heard about our future goals. Um, for addressing climate information needs where one is weak and five is strong. So head on over to the poll part of Slido and start um, entering your views on that. For some reason my monitor, we're not updating just yet, or maybe it's taking people a while to get over there. Check with one of our Slido monitors that everything's working okay. Ah, oh, there we go. Great. Got one little answer starting to come in. I'll just page down to the next one because you can start answering all of these. The second one is Do you think the Lighthouse activities are addressing critical science questions for the coming decade? And if you answered no, we're keen to hear from you about how you think we could improve the lighthouse activities. And I think those are the three poll questions. So um, I'll just keep showing the answers as they come up to let you know we'll start the next session, which is session four at about 10 to the hour, whichever time zone you're in. So if you need to go and take a short break now, please come back um, for that session four and we'll just um, keep monitoring the responses to the survey. And as I said, I'll just keep um, updating the screen so you can see the results as they come in. And I will also note, I think it's okay, um, one of my monitors will tell me if it's not. I think we can leave the survey open for the rest of the um, of the forum. So you know, if, if you've you got can, a bit Helen. to say, yeah, thank you. So if you've got a bit to say, um, and if you're like me and a very slow typer, which I am, <laughs> um, you have got lots of time. So um, don't be, don't feel stressed by the pressure of time on these ones. We'll keep it open for the rest of the forum. Oh, and that's right. I've just been reminded that we actually have an extra question, which is, um, we've put it in here, not at the end, which would you like to be involved in? So yes, make sure you go and look at that question as well. And while you're doing that, can I thank uh, Detlef for chairing session three? And I would like to thank our Lighthouse speakers and also especially to our core activities who, it takes a bit of effort to produce a two to three minute video. Um, so I really want to thank all those people for the effort that they put in um, to prepare to be here. And thanks, Detlef, because you brought the session in on time, which is fantastic.
and there's a note in the chat you can actually come at the end of the forum if you want to we'll keep it open after the end of the forum so you can come back in and add some more if you wish then so we'll resume in about a minute I should also say um, we're hoping to have an evaluation survey after in the next few days it'll go to all of the regist registrants for this so there's a chance to give us some more feedback there too. Helen we're ready to go in panel one. Excellent thank you Beatrice so I think so as I said the survey will stay open so I'm going to move now to introduce and hand over to so introduce this next session and then hand over so um, this is going to be a really interesting session it's the first time we've done something like quite like this in these forums so I'm really looking forward to seeing how it goes we're going to have two panel discussions the first um, exploring opportunities to broaden our engagement where we're um, asked five colleagues researchers from the region to sit on the panel and um, make a few comments and, and interact with the audience and Pascal who's just um, put a camera on will be the moderator along with Svetlana one of our regional focal points so if I could ask Pascal Svetlana and all of the panel members to turn their cameras on this will be a 45 minute session um, and I will hand over to Pascal and I will actually stop sharing so that you're not don't have this in the way Okay, so thank you, Helen, and uh, welcome to all of you for this first panel discussion. So we will moderate this panel with uh, Svetlana Abrad, so I hope you can see uh, Svetlana on the camera. Uh, and then we have, uh, we'd like to thank the panelists to be with us today. And you see that we have panelists with uh, Rodio from different regions um in uh, europe and east uh, western asia and we have with us today so uh, i do not see them on on the on my list so uh, uh wendy bogart from future earth in sweden alexander chernokuski from russia panos aji nikolaos from uh, cypriot Oli lashmi from israel and gamil landig from gerix and representative of yes so to start with, uh, I will ask the panelists uh, to present themselves and also to tell a few words about what they have heard today and introduction uh, statements about the engagement, how they see that, how they see the collaboration, how they see what needs to be strengthened and what they're feeling about this uh, new strategy and the way it's presenting and the way they want to engage. What are the, the key things they have in mind in terms of engagement, what seems appealing to them, and also where they see there could be some caveats in, in what we're doing now. So I will do it uh, with the order I have on, the, on my screen. So I will first invite Wendy. So the idea is you present where you are, what you're doing, and then two to three minutes, no more about this first feeling about uh, a question for the panel. So thank you, Wendy, the floor is to you. Thanks, Pascal. So I'm Wendy Broadgate. I'm the Global Hub Director of Future Earth based in, in our Global Hub in Sweden. And I, I guess I'm here from a, a, a slightly different perspective from the other participants because we um, Future Earth is a sister program to WCRP. It builds on the global change programs, um, the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, the International Human Dimensions Program on Global Environmental Change and Diversitas, which merged to form Future Earth about five years ago. So it, it's a it's a core uh, global environmental change community working for science to underpin our transformations to global sustainability. We're very much um, like WCRP working on system science and a lot of our core projects, which are similar to 
WCRP core projects um, have deep collaboration with the climate scientists within WCRP. We have a lot of formal collaborations with WCRP. So I'm, I, I would like to spend some time on, on this panel sharing some of the mechanisms and the learnings we have from Future Earth and also from the global change programs before Future Earth that evolved over the last 30 years um, for um, engagement with individuals around the world. Um, ultimately, our, our mode of operation is very similar to WCRP. We, we rely on volunteer scientists to engage in our networks. And um, I'd say some of the, the key issues for me are, are making sure that we have a balance of representation of different groups with different expertise, different backgrounds, different um, uh, career stages, um, and different genders on at all levels of the future Earth um, leadership. So, right from our uh, our governing council and our um, advisory committee, um, through the steering committees of all of our projects, um, and down to working group level. And one of the ways that we try to ensure that is by having calls for nominations and when we have uh, gaps on our committees and to always ensure that we have, for example, representation from early career groups. We have a cohort of early career scientists that we draw on for um, these leadership positions, for our workshops, for our working groups and so on. Um, I think. Um, we also have a number of activities that we share with WCRP that I could potentially highlight. Um, a number of our, our global research projects are, and our knowledge action networks are co-sponsored by or with deep collaboration with WCRP. Um, but also our 10 new insights in climate science policy brief that we produce for the UNFCCC uh, climate change negotiations every year is done jointly with WCRP and there the process for producing that reaches deep into our communities to um, find um, uh, key insights from the last 12 months in climate research um, and authors to help us produce that policy brief and elevate the science from across our networks into um, policy processes. But I think I'll stop there as a flavor of the type of things that I would be happy to discuss. Yes, thank you, Wendy. So I forgot also to say to all the audience that for this session also we're using Slido. So I invite you to put your question in, in Slido for the discussion. So when you see something and the same, we will pick up later on the most popular one and interesting for the panel. Uh, so we move to our second panelist, uh, Alexander. Could you present yourself and tell a few words, please? Alexander, are you connected with our sound? So I, I do not see. Maybe you can move to to yeah. LA, uh and wait to for Alexander to connect later. Yes. So we move to Oli then. Okay. Hi, I'm Oli Lachmi. I'm from the Open University of Israel. Uh, I'm an early career scientist. Uh, it's been three years in my faculty position. And I was actually not aware of all the WCRP activities before. I just recently joined as a regional focal point, uh, which helped uh, discuss uh, this forum. Um, but uh, I was uh, aware, of course, of the SIMI projects and, uh, and some conferences related to SPARC. Um, and activities that are more related to my personal field of research, which, which is atmosphere dynamics and the global circulation of the atmosphere. So today was very interesting for me to see this wide, uh, overwhelming scope of the activities of WCRP, uh, which I think not all uh, early career scientists are aware of. And, not everyone knows how to connect to them, so it's a good of opportunity also personally for me to uh, present the, the point of view of a new scientist who are not so much aware of this, uh, these many opportunities. 
Okay, thank you. Can you say just a few words about your uh, your feeling about the engagement in well, what we have seen, so that it complements a little bit your your views? Um, you're asking about what was presented today. Uh, yes, your engagement. Yes. How, how you see the, your views on this panel, and then of course only a few words. We will come back in the discussion on this. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. So the engagement in this panel, yeah. So it's uh, mainly yeah, bringing the perspective of someone who's new to the activity of WCRP. Um, so yeah, what, okay. whatever <laughs> questions you have, you may have. We we'll come back with questions on this. Okay, so thank you. We we will move to Panos. I see you on the screen. So Panos. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Panos Hadzinikolaou, Associate Professor at the newly established Climate and Atmosphere Research Center of the Cyprus Institute. So I will be mainly uh, participating in this, let's say, discussion, mainly from the point of view of me being, mean, being member in a, in a new climate research center that is uh, supported by a, a big European uh, Horizon 2020 teaming project that is meant to, to support the new members uh, to advance the research. So we are focusing in the, this, this project is called the EMECARE. Uh, so we are focusing in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East, the EME region, which is exactly in the boundary of Europe and Western Asia, our focus uh, regions for, this, uh, for today's event. And also, I'm a point of contact of MENA Cordex. So mainly my experience from WCRP, uh, although it has started more than 20 years ago in my previous life as a stratospheric ozone uh, scientist with SPARC. Uh, hello, Neil Harris. Uh, it's mainly through Cordex, which uh, is one of the uh, main activities of the WCRP. Uh, so I can give you some uh, my angle from uh, the experience of a, a domain, a cortex domain, uh, regarding also uh, science engagement. I can start now if you wish, or I can uh, leave it for later. But these are the two, let's say, main uh, my two main properties that I can help you in the discussion. Yes, you can say two words about it, and then we'll come back later. Okay. Uh, about MENA cortex, it is not a numerous. Uh, group of, uh, of modelers and research groups uh, focusing on the MENA domain, the Middle East, Northern Africa domain. And initially, the points of contact were two, Cyprus, uh, the Cyprus Institute, and Sweden, the Swedish Hydrological Institute with uh, Gregory Nikulin. So maybe one example of science engagement is that now we're expanding our points of contact. So now our points of contact will be also uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Morocco, so the western and the eastern part uh, of this uh, of this MENA domain. Of course, this is at the level of the representation, uh, scientific representation in this cortex domain. Uh, I, I want to finish with a with a comment on what I have learned here regarding the science engagement, and I was very glad to see about this WCRP Academy initiative. I find it uh, very novel and very important. It will help uh, in many ways. And further down, I might add a few more words on this. Okay, so thank you. We will come back on this. Uh, so maybe Gabby, you present yourself and a few words about the panel and the question of engagement in it. Sure. Thank you very much, Pascual. So I'm Gabby Langerek. I'm from the Net. Netherlands, and I'm currently based in Germany at JEREX, the Climate Service Center. Uh, my research is focusing on climate change in urban areas, and from the WCRP side, I'm engaged um, in the Lighthouse Activity Development Team of My Climate Risk and also in the Regional Information for Society Home. And I just started as the co-PI of the new Cortex flagship pilot study on urban that was just highlighted by Irene Lacke. Um, but I'm here on the panel to represent an early career perspective from the Young Earth System Scientist community, which is an international and interdisciplinary early career researchers network. In short, I will refer to this network as YES. So I just would like to tell a little bit about um, the engagement that YES had with WCRP over the last years. We built a close collaboration 
um, in the last around five years. This yes was founded in Europe, um, but it was still like very much in Hamburg based European network by then. And around five years ago, we then received a challenge from Guy Brasseur and Dave Carlson to really become an international network. And they said, just get 10 members from 10 different countries across the globe. So then we started tackling this challenge and WCRP started to slowly more and more collaborate with us. And we also, of course, developed a vision and a mission and commenced with really organizing the Earth System scientists into a big network. And we currently span over 2,000 members from over 120 countries. So really a global, truly global network. And of course, we also really try to provide a voice to the young researchers because we believe it's vital to be, be really part of the discussion, to infuse new ideas, to get our enthusiasm out there and to really co-develop this future of climate science across the generations, really for the longer term sustainability of our planet, but also of the science community. So um, just to touch up a little bit on the new structure, we were really happy that in this new WCRP structure, we feel that there's, a, there's an increased openness to really engage the early career researchers in most of the science committees in new panels and in new activities. And I think this will really allow the early career researchers to be part of the discussion and to infuse the ideas at the right time and to really and also get a better understanding of what we can infuse at which time. Um, with respect to the WCRP Academy, we warmly welcome this initiative because it will enable more training for early career researchers in connection with WCRP science. And I would be glad to um, also fuse in some ideas and I'm really wondering how they see the new training needs of early career researchers in this new perspective. I think this was nicely put already as a question between the balance between fundamental and more interdisciplinary or more outward focused training. Um, so for the future, we of course hope that this strengthened engagement will be mutually rewarding for the early career researchers and for the WCRP established community. And we really hope to further and train early career researchers from the different European countries to increase diversity and really to enable the early career researchers community, the diverse early career research community to be part of the future of climate science. Okay. And I'm glad to discuss. Thank with you. Them. Yeah, thank you, Gabby. So I suppose you'll get some important questions during the discussion. Uh, so the, the last one is Alexander. Alexander, is it working now? So is it okay now? Can you hear me? Yeah, so that's fine. Yes, fine. Okay, uh, sorry for this uh, technical problem. So I'm Alexander Chernokulski. I'm from Russia, from Institute of Atmospheric Physics, Russian Academy of Science. So actually, I defended my thesis in 2010, and it was about global climate, clim uh, global cloud climatology comparisons. So mostly in line with the GVEX goals, and but but now I'm focusing more on extreme events. So. I suppose that probably it will be interesting to you to hear about climate science in Russia. So I just a brief um, a brief view about it. So positive things start first. So Russia historically has kind of strong scientific schools um, on climate and atmospheric science, including atmospheric turbulence and optics and so on. One can recall. Uh, such names as Obuhov, uh, Budiko, Marchuk, Andratyev, uh, Zelitinkevich, and many others. Uh, also, I want to stress that year of 2021 in Russia has been declared the year of science and technology. Um, so, and within the framework of this year, the Russian government will start large 10 year long um, scientific program uh, dedicated to climate and environment. Uh, and the study of unresolved climatic issues uh, is among the main tasks of this program, of course. Uh, and most of these issues, they are concordant with the WCRP grant challenges, for instance, um, evaluation and attribution of uh, uh, extreme events, evaluation of carbon feedbacks. I just recall you that 60% of Russian territory is covered in permafrost, uh, studying the permafrost response to warming, measuring corresponding greenhouse gas fluxes is very important tasks, and not only for Russia, but for the, for the entire world, for the uh, global climate. Um, in general, climate agenda in Russia is formulated now as extremely important. Uh, so. Um, and it's not only about mitigation and adaptation stuff, but also about fundamental physical issues of climate, of climate change, of climate reaction to um, external forcing and so on. Uh, 
So we have strong scientific school, we have funding uh, within this program, and we do see an interest in climate uh, science um, among students, among young uh, scientists. So it's kind of positive things. And uh, bad things about Russia, I think the major problem is a language barrier. I sadly see that many collaboration paper or collaboration projects, or even today, most of WCRP projects, they uh, with dozen scientists from dozen countries, they lack Russians, uh, despite of uh, our great expertise. Uh, probably because of this barrier, I just don't know. Probably WCRP Academy will help, may help with this, or may not. I don't know. Thanks. <laughs> That's it. Okay. So, thank you. So we have seen already different uh, perspective on the on WCRP. So maybe I will start the, the question part and the discussion by um, asking you uh, something that is more on your own experience and tell us uh, it's already more out there uh, in your uh, what you said. But what have you seen as a challenge uh, when you started and uh, to be engaged with WCRP? What were your questions and uh, your thinking when you started, and and how it helps you or not to to move into your uh, scientific fields or interactions uh, with different groups? So maybe I will start the, the question with Panos, if you could say a few words about it. Well, with my original climate modeling activities uh, within Cortex, uh, I was given the opportunity to collaborate with uh, other colleagues on a specific domain. So this structure of Cortex in uh, studying and projecting the climate in different uh, limited areas of the world uh, allowed me to to get together also, not only scientifically, but in terms of uh, involving uh, countries uh, from the region. I'm talking about the Middle East, Northern Africa region. And uh, regarding the science again, I would like to give you the example of uh, a, a, another colleague uh, in the Cyprus since George Zitis, which is a young medium career researcher, who by being involved in this dynamical downscaling we do in the Cyprus Institute, but within this cortex, uh, framework. Uh, he has uh, produced, you know, very, very nice and relevant papers, especially for the region. And this, as a, as a scientist professional, gave him the opportunity and the visibility uh, to further develop in the point now that he is uh, the liaison scientist in this big uh, climate change initiative for the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East that the Republic of Cyprus is leading, which is not only scientific, but it's also a political initiative. And, and there is a scientific part and there is a political part. So I'm not going to go more into details. We have also a climate change conference in October. Uh, but this cortex engagement through under WCRP allowed these young scientists uh, to become now a key, let's say, uh, coordinator in the scientific basis part of this uh, big initiative for the region. So, an example. Okay. So, thank you. So, maybe uh, I will ask the same question to Oli because she, I understand, you arrived quite uh, recently in, in in the system. So, what you see the challenges and when you heard that and uh, or to to get involved. Um. Yes, I think that uh, especially for early career scientists, it's uh, important to uh, be focused on the activity of your research field, which uh, can benefit your career. So, uh, for me, the the activity that I heard in my field about is the conferences of uh, Spark and especially the working group on uh, dynamical variability. So um, a conference is a wonderful opportunity to meet your, your science community. Um, but uh, um, except from that, they, there can be also useful opportunities that are beyond the personal research field. Um, for example, opportunities to learn how to uh, use new tools, new models maybe, or um, how to communicate the climate science to the audience because everyone, even 
new climate scientists always get obsessed with questions about climate change. So uh, any kind of these activities could be a good opportunity. Uh, for me, I just uh, 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 organizing. I mean, being in the in the committee that uh, prepared the program for this forum was the first opportunity to engage as a regional focal point, and that was. Uh, um, it opened my eyes to the new to the wide range of activities of WCRP. So I'm sure that in the future, I will be more aware of it and find more opportunities to be engaged. Okay, thank you. And maybe I ask also the same question to Wendy, because I suppose you have a very different perspective and uh, remember the first time <laughs> you engaged with uh, or you heard about WCRP. <laughs> yeah, the first time I heard about WCRP, I, uh, I really can tell you. Um, I worked with IGBP for 15 years before I joined Future Earth and WCRP has been a close collaborator. But I would say from a from a secretariat perspective, um, the the deep engagement with um, the communities <clears throat> often comes <clears throat> in workshops and conferences. And I would say the the in person meetings of of those are opportunities to really um, meet individuals and get to know them and find their interests that that match the different interests within within our within our networks um and and i've been you know participant in in wcrp workshops and conferences over the years and i think that's where i get a deep dive and a connection with the the wcrp community and i think that's where we we make our our uh, broadest connections okay thank you so maybe i Change a little bit the question. I have another one that is more on your nation or regional or institution. And uh, how do you see what should be done or could be done to enhance uh, the participation or to enhance the engagement? And do you see a particular way of uh, something that could be interesting to, to do in the new uh, WCRP framework? So I um, will start with uh, Alexander for these questions. Yeah, thanks. It's a kind of tough questions. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the idea of collaboration, of course, uh, the main idea of uh, WCRP, because it's kind of uh, organization above nations. So uh, how exactly uh, co this collaboration should be, uh, I don't know. Probably start with some kind of email. Just uh, what about the expertise of uh, in your field and so on and so on. Uh, uh, how it works. Uh, so usually uh, WCRP gives us some some way, some uh, some motivation of unresolved questions, uh, unresolved issues in climate, and we can work on it. Uh, but probably yes, probably local expertise uh, can be a kind of. Uh, that can be highlighted from the each institute. Okay, so maybe um, Gabby, could you also comment on this question with a view of do you see different challenges depending on uh, where the early career scientists are, are, are located? Yes, definitely. Um, I think from the early career scientist side or from my side, I, I really see two main ways of engagements that are mainly emerging. So I would say really the first one is to actively foster the next generation by providing training, which I think is really done under WCRP Academy now, and of course also in all the projects, which I think is very important. And we really have to realize this balance between the disciplinary until the very interdisciplinary training and where we want to focus on and how to kind of, I would say, make a, people that are very disciplinary trained very aware interdisciplinary or make people very interdisciplinary trained, depending on which science foci, of course, within WCRP. So I think that's a challenge to kind of define that and set up this kind of new way of training the next generation for the next questions um, that WCRP wants to pose. Um, so there's, I think, some challenge. And then the, the second way of engagement of early careers is really to embed them and really actively make them part of the structure 
and really make them co-developing the science of the WCRP. So, and I think this is increasingly happening in the Lighthouse activities and in the projects in panels and boards, which I really hope, because now it's still kind of an interim structure, which I really hope that this is gonna continue in the final structure and in the implementation, because I really think this having this early career research is really an integral part of WCRP is relatively new, um, but it's really pivotal for the future of the climate science across the generations. Um, I do see there are two challenges as well. The first one is to make sure that we have this continuous need that there is to ensure we have the diversity and this interdisciplinary focus for cross collaborations. So, and I think this is an opportunity and a challenge on its own because I think the early career researchers community, at least from yes, we're really um, spread over the whole globe. So I think we can also help there a little bit. And I th think we're also a bit more interdisciplinary aware. So I see it also as an opportunity but I think it is, remains a challenge to fit those things together. And I think also this new type of engagement where early career researchers are really part of the structure. This is relatively new and there might be also some challenges coming along the way that I can actually not foresee that directly, but um, I think we need some mentoring and also guidance on the workings of WCRP. And I think this kind of regional fora, but also maybe within these projects to have a little bit getting people up to speed that would probably be very helpful so and i really hope that we can pursue this kind of really strengthening of interaction and engagement of early careers in the next phase of wcrp so i uh, i'm looking forward to that actually okay so thank you so do not forget that the, you can ask question on slido and maybe i will ask letana if you see some important question to to raise from this um, q a in slido <clears throat> um yeah hello i guess we have a couple interesting questions now uh the first is from martin uh, how important is engaging in WCRP science to advance your career and help accomplish your science objectives? So, who in the panel would like to start with that? Um, maybe uh, Alexander? Uh, yes, so actually, uh... WCRP kind of motivated my my work because I understand that uh, the work that I did it's really important not only for 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 local institute for for one my supervisor it's really important talk uh, the topic for for the entire uh, climate science so it's kind of gives us a big umbrella that I understand okay I, I can stand a bit behind this. Uh, Below this umbrella, and it's okay. So it's kind of very motivated stuff. Okay, so as I understand I'm... clearly the question. <laughs> yeah, so maybe a few words from panels on this too. Uh, I, I can't kind of answer that, so I will not repeat it. It was about uh, mine and my colleagues, let's say, advancement by participating in the MENA Cortex in our own, let's say, uh, careers in the Cyprus Institute also in the regional uh, context, in participating in regional uh, activities. Okay, so maybe um, Gabby, I suppose you also have a, a, a view on this from, from your point of view. Yes, from my personal point of view, I actually started uh, working at the Secretariat um, around six years ago and I worked there for two or three years. So that was, of course, another way in than most people get familiarized with WCOP, I would say. So I think really from a personal perspective, the, how it benefited my own career was really to get this broader perspective and connection to the bigger picture, and really also to connect and discuss ideas with other scientists across the globe and see what all is out there, and then to see what is your interest. So I think that was the first starting point. And currently I'm more on the, or I'm fully on the science side now. So there it's of course really to see also what are research gaps, what are main um, questions that are posed. So I think it's really, really, really interesting um, thing to connect with WCRP to understand really the research needs and gaps and then to position your own research, your daily work also in that field. Um, so I think these are two, like really from the research side, uh, which is really great with WCRP. And I think from the personal side, it's just, a lot of fun and it's so it motivates so much to work 
with people across the globe that are really interested and very motivated and excellent researchers that really want to push the boundaries of the field with, I think, on questions that you cannot tackle in your own research lab. So I just think that's an incredible motivation to be part of WCRP. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Sledana, some in, another question for the panel? Yeah, and another question. Uh, it is addressed to panels, but I get that it can be for everyone. How can you see uh, the involvement of stakeholders in this region and your experience about this, especially that the region is climate hotspot? Yeah, so Spanos, you start with that. <laughs> uh, this is also connected to a comment I would like to make because uh, my understanding so far was that WCRP was like a, a scientific basis, uh, let's say, uh, networking and activities, but now we're moving into, let's say, climate and society, uh, which includes also impacts and other uh, directions. So in that respect, with the, new, with the newly launched and presented today uh, activities of the WCRP, I see the, I see the role of stakeholders being more uh, with, with WCRP. As regards for the region, uh, this is already happening, not under the, the umbrella uh, formally of WCRP, although we we work and we inform WCRB. Uh, it's about this climate change initiative for the Eastern Mediterranean Middle East. So it all it it's ba it was mainly inspired by the work partly of the MENA Cordex, uh, let's say, science, uh, but now is driving uh, governments to work together for uh, apart from understanding and projecting the climate in the in this region, also to adapt and to mitigate. So this is already happening. Uh, you can find more about it uh, if you visit the Cyprus Institute web page and it really has, as I said before, the science part, but also a, a government part. And uh, it's actually on the for, uh, ministries or foreign affairs level that there is a, a, let's say, an important initiative that is currently taking place, starting and based on the scientific uh, information. Okay, so maybe it could be interesting to hear uh, Wendy about it with, uh, also I suppose that part of it needs to be done in collaboration with others and uh, is there common views on that? The stakeholder engagement? Yeah. Yeah. At the region or for, the, for this region, for the regions? Mm. Um, well, I'd say the the stakeholder engagement is increasingly important that as you as you go down in scale, often talking with stakeholders at a very global scale is very difficult. It's difficult to identify who they are and it's it's difficult to have contact points. So um, at a regional, national and and more local scale, it's it, that's that's the points of contact that you can really establish um, decent dialogue. Um, I would say that the stakeholder engagement is critical for us being relevant and for us producing our, our results um, in a relevant way for society. So um, often having open dialogues with, with stakeholders at an early stage in defining um, science questions is really critical. And then also sort of testing the outputs on them so that, that you're um, often producing outputs in a slightly different way can be much more relevant for your stakeholder than in the way that your model or your output might um, you, you might think from a scientist's perspective. So I think stakeholder engagement is 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 really, really important because often slight adjustments to our plans can make us much more relevant and much more um, able to be for the science to be used. Okay, thank you. So I I suppose we have other questions from the audience of Slip, Slip, uh, Slip and, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Uh, the, second <laughs> the second question is, uh, how can we better involve people from institutes, groups who are not already involved? What is the best way to do that? So maybe I'll start this with Wendy again. And then we do with the other panelists. 
Yeah, no, I think this is this is quite a challenge and something that we need to be really open to. Um, I, I'll go back to the idea of open science conferences being a really important way for uh, new players to display their their work and also to network um, with with the um, the scientists that are already well connected into projects. So I think open science conferences are really really critical. Within Future Earth, we have national committees, national contact points, national networks that we often use to help identify um, new players. So we, we put out calls for, um, for leadership positions, um, for, for committee positions. Um, we reach out to our national groups when we're um, trying to define um, invitees for workshops and so on, and really using the the contacts within our um, our core projects to bring new players from those projects into the more integrated thinking. So I think it, I think it's very very important that the open for the open science conferences really are open, and that we're um, that by participating in those in a way you're you're showing your interest um, and able to speak, um, present, give posters and network in a way that raises the profile of your of your work um, in the context of the, um, the the research projects that WCRP or Future Earth are, are organizing. Okay, thank you. So maybe, uh, Oli, do you have an idea from your uh, regional perspective and country on this question? Yes, um, so in Israel, there are, uh, I think around 30 research groups. Oh, sorry. My, yeah, my connection is not so good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's good. Uh, I think there are around the 30 uh, research groups of uh, climate science and the topics are very diverse. So it's a uh, either cryosphere, uh, physical oceanography, paleoclimate, atmosphere dynamics, aerosols, everything. So I think that uh, one way to uh, find uh, the people, as maybe Alexander suggested, is to kind of map their research fields. And then um, when you know which research fields are there, then you can uh, invite the people to conferences uh, that are relevant to them because people would be interested in their specific uh, field uh, which can promote the research rather than more general topics that are not specific. Okay, thank you. So I see Panos raising his hand. So Panos. Very quickly to add exactly on this. I think it's, uh, it is an issue also of communication. Uh, so how the interested uh, scientists from the different regions uh, or the different levels of education will be, will know about the activities of WCRP. So, uh, there is a question of, you know, how we channel information for the new participants, for new initiatives or ongoing uh, events, uh, etc. So there must be kind of a map in, on inventory. I don't know how this can be organized. And of course, it's also a bureaucratic burden to the WCRP if they are interested. Maybe it's related to the academy a bit, you know, to have a map of, you know, the, who is doing research and what and where from. Okay, so uh, Gabby, a final word with this question? Yeah, I think I've said already a lot how to engage with yeah. the young scientist community. And I, will, I really hope that we can further foster this in a continuous manner. And I'm really looking forward to the next phase of WCRP, hopefully with a, with a stronger engagement and input from young scientists and also for the longer term advancement of WCRP and the climate science as a whole. So I'm looking forward to shape this up further and um, yes, be part of the discussions. Okay, thank you. So we move to the next question, maybe. Oh, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid that um, the time is finished now. So maybe we just start the wrapping up. Oh, so we the time is over, that's what you say? Yeah. Okay, so sorry, I thought we had uh, five minutes or uh, two more. 
so we have to to stop there. Maybe just uh, a final word because I I seen a question that is interesting. That is, uh, we speak also more and more about engaging with social science and people around. So each of you, can you? Uh, tell just in one where do you see this as a challenge, something happening, and uh, something to to go on on. Don't you see it? But just one word from each of you. Uh, Panos to start with. So did you did you say social sciences? I didn't. Keep, yeah. Did you, yeah. Yeah. So do you see it happening? Do you see it as a challenge? Just say one word. That's just to know what what's the feeling on this panel. Uh, sorry, I didn't get the, the word social sciences in the in the context, so I didn't understand the question. Maybe someone else can start so I get the question. <laughs> okay, so uh, Alexander. Uh, I still I, I still see some barriers, uh, so probably it's challenging. <laughs> it's a challenge. Okay, uh, Oli. Uh, yeah, co could you repeat the question, please? I so we also. We will say we absolutely need to reinforce the, the linkages with society science in what we are doing. So do you see uh, it as a challenge or something already happening and it should go on? Uh, it's a big challenge, actually, because uh, it's different languages. Uh, natural sciences and social sciences speak different languages. So, yes, it's a, it's a big challenge on how to connect them. I see it very strongly in Israel that there are many discussions uh, on climate in social sciences, but usually there's not much communication with the natural sciences. Okay, thank you. So, Panos, you're ready now? Yes, I got it now. Uh, I, I would like congrats. to propose something to the social scientists to make a study to connect uh, the scientists with their background education and the first degree, and then in which climate change disciplines they worked uh, from the last 20 years. So it would be interesting to see, and also this will inspire the engagement to see from which scientific field one can actually contribute to the climate uh, science. Okay, thank you. So, Gabby? I think it's a challenge, but I think it's pivotal and we need to embark on this challenge and actually tackle or start tackling this challenge. Um, because I think that's the only way to really make sure that this climate science, that this excellent climate science that is done under WCRP is reaching society in a manner that we need for the, um, for the kind of healthy state of humanity and our earth. So I would really hope that this is going to be done. And I think from an early careers perspective, I hope that we can play also an instrumental role in this, as we are already a bit more aware of this interdisciplinary focus and less disciplinary trend. So I hope that we can be a part of this puzzle. Okay, so thank you. I might be the last one, Wendy, want to see that? Yeah, I think it's essential. It's very important. It's difficult. It takes time. Um, and everybody needs to be, uh, overcome challenges of language and being able to communicate what they mean in in uh, terms that others understand. So I would suggest involving social scientists from early in the process, identify um, identify people that are, are, are big thinkers and uh, from both sides, the natural and the social sciences and and have patience because it takes time. Okay, <laughs> so I see uh, Helen is, um, is uh, the camera uh, on. Uh, so we have to stop there. So I really would like to thank the panelists uh, for the discussion, the audience for the questions. And we see that people are quite uh, appealed by the new structure and the new strategy in WCRP. And uh, I hope you will be all very active in this program and help to have the very good ideas and the science we need to go to go on. So thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I suppose I let the floor to Ellen. Ellen, you have to unmute. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry. I was just saying thank you to Pascal and the panel members. If we were live, we would be applauding now. Thank you for, for that discussion. I'll now hand over um, to Martin. I won't bother showing the slide. I know that Martin will talk us through um, the next panel discussion. So Martin. Um, yes, I think you're just coming on, so I'll hand over yeah. to you and 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 also Eleni, who is your co-moderator. Over to you. 
Uh, thank you, Helen, and I'm having a problem with my main camera, so I'm using my secondary camera, but I think you can see me from the side now, which I think should be just fine. It's perfect, so, well, Martin. It's perfect. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you very your much. Your best side. <laughs> well, who knows? <laughs> thank you very much uh, for asking me and, uh, and really being and allowing me to moderate a great panel on the WCRP coordination, partnerships and collaboration. And we really want to discuss the opportunities to strengthen support for the World Climate Research Program Science. So my name is Martin Risbeck. Uh, I work at Geo Research in Kiel, and I'm a member of the Joint Scientific Committee of the World Climate Research Program. And I'm ably uh, assisted uh, by my co-moderator, Eleni uh, Katraku. She works at the Department of Meteorology and Climate at the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki in Greece. And she's a leading scientist, certainly in the Cortex project. So, uh, Lenny, thanks for being here with me. So, um, before I get to the panel, let me just uh, review quickly what I think I've heard up to this point. It's been a fantastic morning so far. We learned about the WCRP strategy, you know, the scientific objectives around fundamental understanding of the climate system, prediction of the near term evolution of the climate system. The long term response of the climate system and very much so uh, bridging climate science society in the last discussion, I think, was very much about the topic. We heard from the existing core activities that is the CLIAVA, the climate and ocean variability and predictability challenge, uh, the global energy and water exchange programs, click the climate in the cryosphere and also spark. It was mentioned quite a bit during the sessions here, the stratospheric tropospheric processes and their role in climate. We are ably supported by Earth System Modeling and Observations, and CMAP uh, have presented us their activities, but also observations and models uh, really giving us the data information basis upon which we can do the international science and also regional information for societies, Cortex, the flagship activity there is important to us. We learned about the lighthouse activities, uh, which I thought were fascinating summaries about uh, what we're, what's coming ahead of us, about explaining and predicting the Earth system change, safe landings, future uh, of the climate, my climate risk, but also Digital Earth and the World Climate Research Program Academy. So against this uh, uh, backdrop of the World Climate Research Program, we have five panelists now that are going to give us our, their perspective. There's Philip Turkens. He's uh, in the Climate and Planetary Boundary Research Unit of the European Commission. We have Sarah Webb from the National Environmental Research Council of the United Kingdom. We have Antonios uh, Gipapis. He's the head of the Policy and Planning Department uh, of, and the General Secretariat for Research and Innovation in Greece. Susanna Mecklenburg is the head of the Climate Office at the European Space Agency. And last but not least, uh, John Noel Topo, he's the Director of the Climate Services at the European Center for Medium Range weather forecast ECMWF. So I'm going to start with Philip. Uh, Philip, uh, you are heading the Climate and Planetary Boundary Unit under the European Commission in the, in, in the Directorate of Research and Innovation in the Healthy and Planet section. Philip, now what you know about the World Climate Research Program, where you are in your work, what are your initial thoughts about WCRP and how does it relate to your work? Over to you, Philip. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for the invitation first to uh, be in this panel. Uh, I'm really pleased to be with you. Uh, I feel like also uh, going back to my old time as a researcher, I, I'm uh, initially a climate modeler. I worked with some of you who pursued a, a career research and then I shifted to uh, the uh, administration. And now, uh, being in this unit on climate and planetary boundaries, which actually covers climate and biodiversity, nature-based solutions, and environmental observation, that's the scope of, of the activities, the research, of course, research innovation. We fund research, and we uh, also support the policy through research uh, results. And uh, it, it's uh, about my thoughts about this CRP. I, I should say I should update uh, my my thinking because for me as a as a PhD student the WCRP was really the uh, 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 entity that was guiding and providing the vision for climate research and uh, it's admirable what has been accomplished over these decades uh, and 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 now as a representative of a, an entity who funds research uh, I want to pass the message that. Uh, we are very grateful for, for all the achievements 
that uh, the scientists have done through WCRP, and we are very committed to continue to fund uh, climate science, uh, really upstream science as well. Uh, we should immediately dissipate this um, a misunderstanding where some scientists see that where we uh, fund uh, applied activities with this regard fundamental research or basic research on climate processes and modeling this is not the case we really fight every day to make sure that uh, we can cover the full spectrum of the uh, innovation value chain but this chain is evolving so i, I may come back to that uh, uh, when i intervene uh, later we have just a, a, a few seconds or our mandate. Our mandate is, uh, of course, to identify the critical research innovation gaps and to define our priorities in what is called the work program of uh, the research uh, framework program Horizon, now becoming Horizon Europe. It entered into force in, in, in May. So we, uh, you will see uh, the, the calls uh, coming up. But I should stress also that we, uh, since the uh, policy context has evolved, uh, we now need to uh, frame uh, our activities in the transition. Uh, we know where we have to be in uh, by 2050, and this changes the picture somewhat. And it's very important that researchers working on the fundamentals of climate science do integrate this dimension uh, because it's changing a bit the career uh, perspective for you as well as it did for us. Uh, we are evolving. I'm sure that climate science is, is also evolving to... Uh, provide the solutions, the tools, the information, the knowledge that is needed for to implement the transition, which is our first priority. Uh, and we want in this to cover both the mitigation aspects and adaptation uh, components, uh, in particular the adaptation part that is has been sometimes a bit uh, disregarded uh, in the past. We can discuss further. Thank you. Fantastic, Philip. These are great comments, uh, which I very much appreciate. Let's move over to Sarah. Sarah, you are an associate director of the National Environmental Research Council, which is part of the UK's research and innovation system. You have responsibility for developing new international research programs, and this catalyst role ensures that the UK remains international and you address the pressing challenges faced through climate change and biodiversity loss. So it sounds to me like your work, your work very much could benefit and is connected to the World Climate Research Program. Over to you, Sarah, what are your perspectives? Sarah, we can't hear you. Uh, can you maybe work on your microphone? Can you hear me now? Perfect, thank you. I've been having sound problems, so I'm having to look through the computer but use the phone it, it doesn't seem to work very well um firstly i'd like to say thank you very much for inviting me to participate today and i'd just like to actually sort of put into perspective uh where, where um i fit into the uh, the picture so i'm part of the uk research and innovation which is bringing together the research disciplines spanning arts and humanities social biological physical engineering um, as well as the environmental sciences and one of the key things that we're really striving to do and I'm seeing that this is actually coming through from the WCRP as well is the interdisciplinary nature that is absolutely critical to actually solving some of the large problems that we have uh, we are as a natural environment research council we're truly international because the environment and climate don't recognize the geographical or political boundaries so our researchers and our research actually covers the whole planet from the edge of the atmosphere to the centre of the earth. And I think this is really you know, um, important that we continue to do this to actually understand planetary processes and the impact that we're actually having on our environment and ways that we can actually start to um, address this. Um, we're living in times of unprecedented changes, I'm sure everyone's aware, um, and people are impacting the planet more than ever. Um, and while you know, we, we, we've seen in the past that people have said, oh, it's not so bad or anything else, We've had the recent COVID, and although we're starting to emerge from this, there is actually um, positive um, in a way. I'm not trying to sort of uh, belittle or anything else, the um, absolute human tragedy that we've seen, but we can start to see what's happening with impacts on um, lower emissions from fewer flights and actually see how even today you know, we're engaging um, online rather than face to face. So we need to look at how we can become more sustainable overall. And of course, uh, for the UK as well, um, it would be remiss of me if I didn't mention that um, uh, the 26 United Nations Climate Change Conference that's happening, which actually gives the UK and um, us as a funder a fantastic opportunity to really reach out to global communities, business researchers, 
to try and actually get them to listen and see how we can showcase international science and, and actually show them just what's actually happening and the impact and what more needs to be done. So from this perspective, um, the actual linkages to WCRP, I think is absolutely crucial going forward in building new interactions, new engagements, bringing the whole science community together. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing actually how going forward uh, we can start to work together more to, to take to um, start to tackle some of these challenges and really make um, a continued and greater impact than ever. Fantastic, Sarah. Thank you very much also to bringing in the connection to uh, parties on UNFCCC this year. We're very much looking forward to it. And obviously, that's one of the key stakeholders uh, at the global scale for sure uh, for the climate research program. Antonio, over to you. Uh, you are the deputy head of the policy planning department in the general secretariat for research and innovation of Greece. I know you support the climate research infrastructure. So how important is the World Climate Research Program in your work? Over to you. Cannot hear you yet. Can you do something on the sound? Can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Uh, okay, thanks. Thank you, Martin. And uh, good afternoon to everyone in uh, this uh, interesting uh, panel. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Katragu uh, for invitation to speak uh, in the WCRP Climate Research Forum. Uh, I think that the climate research landscape needs to constructive interaction ex expertise of all uh, these uh, stakeholders uh, so as to tackle the research questions uh, answering to real uh, life uh, challenges. Uh, the General Secretariat for Research and Innovation, where I work, uh, compresses a, a pivotal actor in this uh, endeavor in Greece, uh, planning and implementing uh, suitable policies uh, to ameliorate research and innovation and pr prioritizing uh, how research and innovation can uh, yield uh, results with a great Im impact to the country's uh, welfare. Priorities and funding do not uh, concern only uh, in climate research, uh, of course, but still climate research seeks uh, to respond uh, to very real uh, challenges. Uh, challenges that can be very local uh, and at the same time uh, universal. Uh, this is uh, why research results produced in the country can play a significant role for the scientific communities and questions uh, raised in uh, also in other regions. This is why the implement uh, internationalization of research and uh, research as mobility can help us attain uh, safer and uh, quicker results. And I think this is why uh, supranational funding can contribute to stronger scientific consortia, more ambitious research projects, better infrastructures, and improve uh, results uh, for the benefit of our global community and the treatment of uh, social and uh, planetary uh, challenges, I think. Fantastic, Antonio. And I think really a congratulation to Greece. Uh, you know, you are in an area in the Mediterranean region where climate is really important. And it's really fantastic to see how your country is supporting uh, the world climate research program and climate research at the regional and global level. Over to uh, Susanne. Susanne Mecklenburg, uh, you were a mission manager for climate relevant European Space Agency satellites. Quite a few of us know you from that, but now uh, you head the ESAS, the European Space Agency's climate office. So, how important is the World Climate Research Program to your work uh, today, Susanne? Over to you. Yes, thank you, first of all. To speak here. Um, yes, it's very important, of course. Um, many of the uh, identified research again uh, under uh, is really uh, very much what we would like to address from a European Space Agency's perspective in terms of measurements and how we can actually contribute to climate by providing. It's uh, that was my first job. Um, that 
that we are providing from the chain. And but uh, another um, very interesting part so that um, we're working with CCL publishing the um, CMIP project um, at ESA, for which we also like to be host, I think, the opportunity to connect um, uh, the opening to a certain project in our plan. Susanne, you're breaking a bit. Maybe can you try to turn off your video? Maybe the sound is a little better then. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's and I hope that um, uh, that we we will be working uh, very closely uh, with the modeling community in the future. So, um, I think um, the connection between WCLP and and you know ESA's remit in in providing um, detailed, uh, high quality climate relevant data and making that connection to the modeling community is, is very, very important for ESA. Fantastic, Susanna. I think, uh, and again, a, a big thank you to ESA's continuous support of the World Climate Research Program and many of the projects over the years. Uh, you've been a strong stronghold for uh, supporting uh, the activities there. And I think in particular also in the data gathering and the support now of the modeling is just uh, so great to hear. Uh, my the next panelist is John Noel. Uh, you are the director of the Copernicus Services at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, and you are responsible for the Copernicus Climate Change Services 33S as well as the Copernicus Atmospheric Modeling Service CAMS. So, uh, on behalf certainly of the European Union. So, uh, John Noel, from where you sit, how important is the World Climate Research Program to your daily work? Um, thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, you can hear me correctly? Yes? Perfectly. Okay, Wonderful. good. Yeah, it's such a, a pain sometimes, uh, but today it seems to work my uh, Wi-Fi. So, yes, thanks for uh, inviting me um, with my hat as a director of Copernicus Services at ECMWF. Uh, I'm not alien to uh, WCRP, of course, as I have also been involved in uh, WCRP as co-chair of uh, WIGNI and more recently co-chair of WDAC in, uh, in, in the past. So for those who don't know, Copernicus is a um, European Union uh, Earth Observation Program uh, looking at, uh, at the planet and its environment. And it offers information services that uh, draw from satellite uh, observations, the Sentinels, third-party satellites in situ and modeling information. And ECMWF has been uh, interested, as you, as you said, uh, uh, Martin, by the Commission to operate uh, two Copernicus services, uh, CAMS and C3S. So for the, co for the question you asked, yes, uh, definitely very important as well. So first of all, um, I would like to perhaps state the obvious about what we do, and which is to provide uh, operational environmental services, uh, supporting the decision uh, or the policy making by transforming the data into actionable information, uh, something communities, governments, and businesses, and so forth can rely upon. So for this to work, uh, there is really a need to establish uh, authoritativeness and trust in the data, which includes quality assurance, traceability, documentation, standards, but also accessibility, usability, and social um, societal relevance. And to achieve this, and I can speak about the uh, C3S, but uh, I'm sure it applies to climate services in general. Uh, ECMWF has been really uh, heavily relying on the scientific excellence in Europe and worldwide, uh, be it within uh, academia, modeling centers, space agencies like uh, uh, ESA, and uh, environmental agencies or meteorological services. So this really, really relies critically on the uh, um, underpinning science, uh, which go into the data, the products, and the expertise. And this is where the WCRP comes into play, and at several levels. So first, uh, let's say at fundamental level, so climate products, be it reanalysis, seasonal forecast, climate predictions, are based on simulations and observations, which heavily rely uh, more on an underpinning science, process understanding, modeling uh, improvements, etc. But secondly, and equally uh, importantly, in my view, WCRP can also work together with services in bridging the gap between science and society. 
Climate change is global, but impact is often regional and local, as we have heard uh, today. So interacting with decision makers at regional or local level, uh, ingesting socioeconomic knowledge in the services is a huge task where research and operations, uh, in my view, can meet. So the fourth scientific objective of WCRP, from that point of view, is, is, is really key. And, and last, I would say that uh, I could also mention training based on what was uh, discussed this morning. Uh, I think it was mentioned by uh, Andrew earlier. And we're also partnering between WCRP and climate services, maybe a path to explore, because uh, even if the audiences can be broad and somewhat different, there is also a lot of commonalities uh, resources to take advantage uh, of. And um, my last point, perhaps, is that uh, what we've learned over the last six years or so is that the user needs are evolving very rapidly and the readiness of sectors to tackle uh, adaptation, uh, for example, or but also mitigation is there and our role is really to respond and facilitate the uptake and minimize the barriers, with, be it techni technological or societal. And uh, I would like to echo what Philip uh, said uh, earlier, Philip Tolkens, on the, um, the fact that uh, Europe is also funding the underpinning science and not only the innovation and the, and, the, and the downstream. And this is extremely important for operational services like Copernicus. Thank you. Fantastic, Jean Noël. And I think it was also great to see that in addition to what, what Sarah mentions, the connection of one of the stakeholders, which is the assessment, but also now the rapidly growing climate services activities is really a new stakeholder, which we should be, be taking very much into account as we develop the new WCRP activities and structures. So thank you very much for that. Eleni, I'd like to go over to you. Maybe you can just see if there's some interesting already happening at Slido, and then I might actually take that question, frame it a bit back to our panels. Eleni, over to you, and thanks for being here with me. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, yes, we have a question, and I think uh, it's addressed to Antonius and Sarah. And the question is, are there possibilities for more continuous funding forms allowing for longer term research, planning and development and time to involve users in social sciences more? What a great question. So it is a question yeah. about. Uh, yeah, about the how the, how we can really strengthen the resource base uh, for WCRP. And so let, let's start exactly maybe with Tony or you and then Sarah and then anybody else who wants to sort of come in. Uh, if, if I could understand, they, they ask about the involvement of uh, the social sciences or not. Well, that and also longer term science projects, which are more integrated. So fundamental science, but also involving more interdisciplinary types of teams. Uh, the, the, the second uh, part of the question, I think, uh, yes, as we, we, we work on it uh, uh, to, to funding uh, uh, research uh, uh, in all uh, areas that, that we have not only basic but also uh, uh, applied research and and uh, and we try to have also interconnections with the industry uh, and with uh, uh, other stakeholders that they are related to research and innovation programs uh, about the social sciences i think uh, it, it is a very good question because we need uh, in greece as well to strengthen a little bit more uh, the funding and and uh, the involvement of of so social sciences in uh, every area of research, so not only in, in in environment and climate, but also in other areas. So it is for us, I think, a challenge uh, because at the moment we are planning the new programming period, uh, 2021 to 2027, to to put a little bit more engagement. In, 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 in this uh, part of science. Fantastic, Antonio. I'm sure, Sarah, that is your day job, right? To do the long-term strategy planning also about resources. So what are your thoughts on that question? Uh, well, uh, one of, over to Sarah one of, now. one of the things that we've been doing um, for the last few years um, is we have been trying to get the interdisciplinarity and the transdisciplinarity across in our program. There's no point in just doing the, the research if you can't actually communicate it out and actually utilize and make the impact. Um, so for that reason, one of the, the big funds that we have done in, in the past is 
Global Challenges Research Fund, and this, this is actually to bring in all the different uh, research disciplines together so that you can actually look at the um, impacts on the environment, bring in the um, uh, engineering side, maybe develop new tools, bring in the uh, arts and humanities, uh, social science side to actually work with um, understanding the local cultures so that you can actually translate this then to the local needs and to the policy makers and, and that type of thing. So I strongly support the need for more interdisciplinarity in the research and making sure that we are actually um, enabling our researchers to come together as um, a sort of cross-discipline group as well. One of the things that we're looking to do potentially for the future, obviously all this depends on sort of funding cycles and things like that, and we get the majority of our funding from central government, is um, if we can actually have people so that they um, understand other disciplines, so they're not just rooted in one particular discipline. Because when we've asked our, our research communities, what will make a real difference? What's the next thing we need to do to really uh, make sure that um, the research is uh, actually targeted at the right place, we're doing the right thing, and be it um, at a local, regional, global scale, whatever. And they're saying actually understanding and being able to actually cross over from discipline. So that's one thing that we're actually looking at. Uh, of course, the big challenge that we all face, um, and I, I will touch on it lightly, um, is around the continuity of funding. Um, you know, th this is something that um, we are all on different funding cycles, uh, linked to different funding mechanisms. Um, this can provide a really big challenge, and certainly I'm seeing on the international scale, our funding cycles don't necessarily meet up with other countries' funding cycles and things like that. So that, that's one of the big challenges as well, I think, going forward, as to how do we uh, have it so that we can uh, say to governments that maybe we do things in slightly different funding periods or cycles or expand it out to enable us to really get the collaborations going, because I think is actually one of the big hurdles now. We've, we've seen how um, the, the, the local populations and general public are understanding more about climate change, understanding about recycling and plastics use. We now need to actually try and get it so that the governments actually understand the need to work collaboratively internationally. Fantastic, Sarah. And I think if you see any role for WCRP, the Joint Scientific Committee, to help you with this issue around synchronizing funding cycles and all of that, I think we'd be very much interested in, you know, convening another meeting around those times. I want to take this, uh, and I think Philip already has raised his hand, you know, long-term funding. Philip, you know, missions is the big new game, I understand, in Europe. I'm sure you have something to say in this arena. Over to you, Philip. Yeah. Uh, quickly, on inter interdisciplinarity, uh, I, I will address the other point after. Uh, so, uh, having seen the evolution of the formulation of the goals uh, in the work program of Horizon uh, since a number of years, I think, I think that there's absolutely no barrier to uh, include social science. Actually, it's really requested. But uh, the, the progress also depends very much of the mentality of the researchers who apply to this. Uh, still, I mean, now with the new generation, I think the openness is much greater than before. Uh, and this is a fantastic achievement, but nevertheless, we still have some pockets of uh, resistance where uh, some conservative uh, scientists still believe that it's better if they have their little niche and don't open up to those or uh, see the dialogue with social scientists as a loss of time. Let's make it clear. This is not the case. Collective, collective intelligence is working, and in particular on this issue where the outcome of the, of the science has a, a whole impact of the transformation of society, uh, it doesn't make any sense to remain confined in uh, natural sciences or mathematics or modeling. We need to open up to all the, the communities, and this is happening, and it is certainly not the European program that will prevent this from happening. You are strongly encouraged to do so. On the cycles, there there is no miracle. Uh, we we cannot fund uh, fund projects for a very long periods. We are constrained by the cycles. So as is it the UK, even if they took their freedom, they did not not increase the length of their cycle. Uh, and we'll be ha very happy, of course, to cooperate with them uh, in their new uh, in the new configuration of Horizon Europe. Where the UK uh, should be uh, uh, should an associated uh, state, but they have their national program, of course, and it's our duty, national uh, and, and funding agency, to kind of organize the the flow 
so that there are always opportunities uh, for the researchers that are of limited time, but there is some continuity in the business and no, no, no gaps. Uh, that is very important and it's part of our uh, duty. And with regard to the mission, as you evoke that, um, the mission is, is uh, a new way of working, but it's not a new instrument per se. It will not fund research for a decade, but we indeed have an objective through the mission uh, over uh, a decade. I can come with more details on that. And uh, but it, it also will call in uh, scientists working on quite fundamental aspects, but they need to be open to testing their solutions on the ground because that's what the mission is about. And uh, yes, I'm happy to elaborate on, on this uh, if there is an opportunity. Fantastic, Philip. I think that's so rewarding. Eleni, I want to go uh, back to you. Any interesting questions from Slido to the panel here? Um, yes, we have uh, not um, very many questions, but there is one, and to this one I would like to uh, also add a little bit more on my own, if I may. And this is a question to Jean-Noël, um, and uh, we know that uh, C3SO, the Copernicus Climate Change Programme, has done a great investment uh, on both climate-related science, so investigating a lot of climate-related topics, but also contributed significantly to building large climate infrastructures. Um, and um, this has been done through a numerous release of tenders uh, in a wide range of topics, and including both science and science distillation uh, issues. So the question coming from audience is, um, how do you think uh, that, um, how, what are your thoughts on how it's better to go on with this distillation data and go from uh, data to go to information and knowledge and finding understanding better understanding climate and wisdom so the, the property of this 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 value chain from data to knowledge and the second thing that's coming from my part is if you think there will be any uh, ways in the future to um, uh, involve WCFP in a way of um, uh, letting WCFP uh, help in the co-development of future tenders, uh, because as you have already seen in the previous session, WCFP has already a large, uh, a broad topic of, of interest, including science and uh, information distillation, academic ad academic things and so on. So if you see in the future uh, some, some ways of uh, uh, going to this direction of co-development with WCFP. Wow. <laughs> if, I, uh, if I need to repeat something, let me know. I'll be happy that, to that's do a, so. That's a broad... Uh, no, no, but uh, basically, uh, what is the future of uh, of Copernicus and how it can uh, resource a bit uh, WCRP? I mean, we, we have to operate within our boundary conditions, of course, and uh, Copernicus is, uh, services in particular, it's not a funding agency. But... Um, Having said that, there are several ways of uh, of collaborating, and some of the tenders that we have issued uh, about building the infrastructure, um, uh, also curating some of the uh, of the data sets, taking advantage of uh, what is coming from the uh, ESA Climate Change Initiative, for example. This is something which is already um, contributing to for the uh, science community to perhaps focus more on the science, and they don't have to. Uh, worry about the uh, operationalization and the access to the data because this is taken care of by the services like uh, Copernicus. So this should really continue. In in the past, we have also um, uh, funded some uh, activities around some uh, regional uh, cordex uh, runs uh, over uh, over Europe because uh, based on requirements, some uh, gaps were uh, identified and would uh, impede the quality of the services. And this will continue. We will be listening to the uh, to the users and we will try to uh, uh, respond to the users uh, as um, efficiently as possible. This is what I, I had said uh, before. So uh, where does WCRP uh, come into play uh, in this is that these user requirements should also uh, take into account the, um, uh, the WCRP strategy, which is also involving the, uh, the users and the scientific community. And this should be reflected in the tenders that we will uh, issue in the, in the future. So I would say that uh, the scheme that we have is, is, is uh, working quite well. So the underpinning research is really something which is more in the remit of uh, uh, of Philippe, if I may say so. 
but uh, in terms of uh, operationalization that access infrastructure, we need really to uh, facilitate the, uh, the provision of uh, scientific data and scientific information to, uh, uh, to all the stakeholders. So it's a sort of a wishy-washy um, answer, but I think it's um, the, the, the future from that uh, point of view is, uh, is reasonably clear and we all have a role to play to, uh, uh, to make sure that uh, there is enough support for uh, the science to, uh, uh, to flourish for the services. Fantastic, John. Well, I think it's really great to see uh, how you are thinking about, you know, the fundamental science and the work and research program also touches a bit more with solution orientation and how that can be also supported by some of the more operational uh, challenges and, and issues that you have at your house. I want to, uh, Eleni, if I may, I'm going to take the, the moderator's uh, prerogative here and want to reflect back to Susanne. Susanne uh, is, uh, is part of ESA. And certainly, you know, the, the support you're doing is fantastic, in particular for the CMIP office. Uh, I know ESA is a great supporter for workshops, but also many of us know ESA for missions, you know, for satellites, you know, new uh, exploration of the climate science. So, so maybe, Suzanne, over to you, whatever element you want to bring in as a support element of WCRP science from a space agency's perspective. Over to you, Susanna. Yes, actually, I, when I was listening to um, Jean-Noël's um, I was just thinking, uh, I, I totally second uh, these um, different um, uh, aspects that he, he brought forward. Um, I mean, ESA is, of course, um, the business and the Earth Observation Program in ESA is uh, to develop, to develop uh, satellite missions that address the requirements of our various um, international organizations for, for science, but uh, also for operational applications, um, for example, through through Copernicus. And um, this is a continuous uh, process that we are leading there. Um, we are continuously consulting uh, with our communities to be sure that we're actually addressing with the development of new sensors, um, the, the requirements um, of scientists and um, you know, entities that um, develop uh, applications that could also potentially address uh, a changing climate. Um, and, um, you know, the new missions uh, coming on now, um, also um, the Copernicus um, uh, X, essentially, of the Sentinels that is already um, there. Uh, one very important part is the CO2 emission, which will help us also uh, in, in respect uh, of um, providing data for the first and second global stock take that will take place uh, under in 2023 and 2028. And here I actually wanted to make um, a, um, a short link back also to a topic that was uh, addressed earlier, because um, I think one of the main challenges that we're facing uh, at the moment is also the connection of what is now in the research um, area and how we can actually connect that to policymakers. I mean, one of the big drivers that we are facing in, in the future and for which uh, WCRP is very much um, providing their support in understanding the, the physical processes really um, is, of course, the, um, the Paris Agreement. But I think one of the big challenges that we're facing is to make that transition between um, research um, knowledge into something tangible to somebody who is a policymaker and enforcer, let's say, who has not necessarily a background in Earth observation and in climate understanding and um, uh, in, in climate research. So I think this is probably something that we really need to address uh, in, a, in a more detailed way in the future. And um, in our new uh, climate program that we're currently designing in ESA, um, we will go very much in that direction and try to uh, set up expert networks by which we can actually interact with national authorities so that we can actually carry the research that we're doing, maybe in collaboration with WCRP, for example, into a more sort of societal benefit area uh, in the future. And I think that's that's a major point to, to bear in mind as well. But I think that has been addressed in many parts of the new WCRP strategy, um, especially with those cross-cutting activities, lighthouse activities, uh, with the communication and outreach activities. So I think that's, that's a really important part. Martin, Fantastic. sorry to intervene here. Sorry, but I've got to know that we have less than three minutes to, exactly. to wrap up. Thank you. 
Eleni, thank you very much. I was just going to say, colleagues, it's been a fantastic round uh, having uh, you on, on, my, on my panel here, on our panel, about uh, how opportunities to strengthen the support from WFCP. I must say I'm very optimistic. All of you gave us some examples of, from, of how you can support WCRP, how are you supporting WCRP, but also going forward. I think it gives me a lot of hope uh, that the new plan will see resources coming on board from a very different perspective. Uh, we can certainly spend another hour discussing the details of that. But it's still so great to see that there's an alignment about the work that you do and the strategies that we are putting out. And I think it was fantastic also, Eleni, to have you here with me as my co-moderator of the panel. I think uh, we were giving a very lucky and a very good panel here. Uh, the diversity of views are great. Uh, I'm just going to end my summary with a little plea, is long, but, but, but keep in your mind that we're convening here the European region, which is traditionally known as resource rich, who can afford to do fundamental climate sciences, and all of you who have access to resources, we would very much also welcome you to think about how you can, in your neck of the wood, also support those regions of the world which are not as favorably endowed with resources. I think this is something that we don't discuss here deeply, but I want to give you that thought with you. We are talking about the World Climate Research Program and issues like leaving nobody behind. So areas of working together with other regions of the world is very important to us also in Europe, and I'm sure it is in your organizations. Uh, thank you very much to being such a great panel. And I wish all of you a, a great day, but we're not quite done yet, Helen. I think I'm just going to hand it over back to you and that left to wrap up the whole session. So thanks again, panelists. It was fantastic. Eleni, thanks for the support. And we're looking forward to the last 10 minutes. Well, thank you so much, um, Martin. And thanks especially to the panel. That was, I feel quite privileged actually to have been part of that conversation and found there were so many important messages there. So, so a big thank you to you all and to Eleni as well. So, yes, we are in the last 10 minutes and we are losing people. So um, I'm going to bring up the, the slide pack just to, um, to bring us to close. But I guess um, really this final session, what we wanted to do was, can I multitask here? Probably not, <laughs> uh, was to just reflect, give Detlef and myself the opportunity to perhaps um, reflect now, why isn't that sharing? Um, reflect what, on what we've heard, and then we'll just wrap up with you know how you can you can contact us. So, with any luck, technology has worked so well so far. Just doesn't want to bring up the PowerPoint for some reason. Try again. If it doesn't work, it doesn't really matter. We can just talk. Um, if Detlef is okay with this, while I try and sort out this little technical problem, is a I've got some reflections, Detlef, but maybe I'll go to you for any from you to start with, and then we'll come back to me. Is that okay? Yeah, Helen, thank you very much. Um, this is okay, and I can can easily start. I mean, it's needless to say that, of course, there was a lot of information that came out today. And that needs to be distilled. And so whatever I can say right now is, is only kind of uh, preliminary and picking on a few aspects. And, and so uh, one thing is, of course, we have to be brief. And so that limits also what we can say here. Uh, but looking back, why do we do these fora? Um, as we have said in the beginning, um, it's actually to inform and to uh, start a dialogue. Um, and um, so what I really liked is um, the, the input we got uh, with respect to the, the presentations, um, the, the discussion we had, but then in particular the output from these two panels. It, it was really, to some extent, eye-openers. And um, this, is in fact, is a sentence that Oli said um, in response to what she heard today. And I found that actually extremely important to see that, in fact, there's a lot of information about WCRP that is not out there. Um, that people need to have. And, and so as somebody said it's an issue of communication and that might have re be related to a slightly different aspect. But in fact, it, it turns out that a lot of things are uh, an issue of communication also with the next generation. Um, 
Um, the fact that we heard uh, from the first panel that, in fact, that what we do is, is also helping a lot for the career development of young people is important. We have to build on and we have to expand on this part. And I think this is where the, the part of WCRP where we are in right now becomes so important. But um, because, I mean, wherever we start now a new lighthouse activity or expand on the core project and so forth, um, this is where a new career can start. Where, in fact, a lot of work can build on and, and continue. And I think it's, uh, this, this, this first discussion, I think we can actually um, have a lot of um, uh, fruits that we can gather from this and, and uh, take it into the next level of discussion to learn from it and to build on it and expand. And um, so this was one part. And, and the, the, the second panel, I really enjoyed also that discussion. And in fact, the fact... That, that sort of the, what I might just call funding agencies online, we have heard from John Noel, because he's not a funding agency, but kind of the, the these uh, these agencies, um, uh, I think it, it, it the, the second panel underlined kind of another <coughs> need um, uh, for WCRP to act on. It's not just sort of the science authority, it's also to, in fact, the interaction with the funding agencies. And this was... One of the reasons why we have this discussion, um, there seems to be a lot of interest in it. And I think this is something we have neglected probably in the past. We really have to expand this, and not just for Europe, but around the world. And so one of the reasons for these research fora is, in fact, to initiate this discussion on a regional basis. Martin is very correct. We are WCRP, W World um, uh, climate research program. We have to do this in all the regions um, around the world, the global north, the global south. And I think the discussion today really has underlined the need for what we intended to do here. In that sense, um, it is a big success. Um, thank you very much to Helen and the entire team. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to really following up this discussion on various different levels. Helen, over to you. Thank you, Detlef. And um, the gremlins have finally struck, but that's okay. Um, Beatrice may or may not be able to bring up the last two slides, but it's okay because they're actually were simply a repeat of the slides that I showed before we moved into the panel discussion, which was just really picking up on your last point, Detlef. Um, I'll just start my video. Um, which is that this is the beginning of, of a dialogue and we're very keen to explore ways to follow up in whatever in whatever format that looks. Um, we're holding these forums around the world and actually I wanted to say that this is the fifth of these forums and thanks to Europe, we've just hit the 1000 mark. We have actually engaged with 1000 people around the world um, through these forums. So there's a lot of information and feedback that we're getting and we've got to distill that to some degree. Thanks, thanks Beatrice for bringing that up. So if we could just go to uh, slide 36, I think it is, the next I'm one down. To um, oh, God, waiting. Just the next one, just go page down. Yep, keep going. So in terms of what, um, yes, that's it, thank you. Um, in terms, just very briefly, we've only got a couple of minutes. Um, my reflections, I thought there were such important messages there from um, not just the funding agencies, because as we've heard, you know, Jean Noel and, and Copernicus are not a funding agency, but such important messages there about um, the need to support the underpinning and the applications. I'd sort of this point about it's not either or to really address these big challenges that we've got, we've got to invest in, in both. And I think that was that was a, an important message. Martin's point about the importance for WCRP of connecting with nations and regions that are perhaps not as well represented and thinking more about how we can do that. So one of the questions that will be in the evaluation, um, part of it is, you know, what are some of the things that we can be doing to better um, do that, that outreach into those, into those areas? Pan, the first panel, um, such important points about language and the barriers that language bring, whether it's um, in the nation and in your national language. Um, I think those were good points that I think it was Alexander made, but it's also about physical sciences and social sciences. Um, and we've been criticised in WCRP for our own language because we use too many acronyms. Um, Gabby made that point right at the beginning. So let's take note of that. And the important role that early career researchers are going to play in taking a more um, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary um, 
approach to some of these wicked problems that climate change is confronting. As Detlef said, there was a lot of good messages, important, useful feedback there that we need to distill. But I'm going to wrap up now. So um, Beatrice, if you could just go to the next slide um, and actually the next plus one. So this is just making the point that, you know, if out of today there's something that you'd like to follow up with this, then please do. That's the message. Uh, here's the slide with the ways that you can engage with us. Um, so we look forward to that. Thank you all for being here today. It was a really interesting forum for me. I'm sure for others in the WCRP and I hope for the broader audience. Um, just to say the, um, the survey is still open but I'm not sure that we're going to be able to bring up the results um, right now. And I think we're losing people anyway. So we won't try and do that. But if you want to go in and add some more information to the survey, please do. And it's um, 29 minutes past the hour. So with that, I will finish by thanking you all very much and wishing you a very good day. And I'll just let Dethlef have the last word. Well, actually, um, I, I do I do repeat um, the thanks um, the thanks to all the people who participated um, today, but also in the preparation. And that thanks, of course, goes um, in particular to Helen um, for doing this around the world. And um, I think we are looking forward for a continuous dialogue. Um, this is uh, in Europe and Philip and everybody else. Um, be sure that I, I next time I call, um, yeah, I want to follow up. And 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 I think. Uh, for everybody here on this on these various panels, I think this is a starting point um, that we will continue. Thank you. Thanks, Detlef, and and good day to everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. So good bye. And thank you. Lots of interesting discussions. Thanks, Pascal. Yes, and Bye thanks, for Pascal. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and also Martin as well. That was, yes. Those were really interesting panel discussions. We're still it was a great panel. People. I was very pleased, Helen. Thanks for giving me such a wonderful. <laughs> Oh, well, I think uh, I think the panel design was a co-design effort, actually, Martin. So, <laughs> but yeah. it did work out very well. I thought that was yeah, great. Yeah, no, it was, it was a great panel.